guys saw my Swarty Euro videos just wanted to remind everybody before I start today when we're talking about uh, when you hear white servitude or European you know don't automatically think so-called white or pale skin you know there was melanated dark-skinned Europeans this is information and history they never told us I mean we kind of knew but it's really deep and we got to start correcting history we got to start putting it in their face more and more and more it doesn't matter how many times they're gonna say cultural vultures or or I mean, this, this is history, this is true. All right, this is Charles V right here. These are Minoan women, that's ancient times. That's like Minoan women, look at them. Indeed, not a single English or American sailor or traveler captured at sea by North African pirates between 1600 and 1775 described himself or herself as a white slave or even as white uh, in over uh, three dozen published memoirs. Instead, they described themselves as Christian captives as Christian slaves, and frequently as English slaves. To be a white slave was to be a Muslim, and if born in Europe, to be someone who had converted to Islam, a so-called renegade. Mm. To be a white slave was to be a Muslim, and if born in Europe, to be someone who had converted to Islam. To be a white slave or a white servant in North America in the 1680s was likewise to be understood as a trafficked subject. To be a white slave or a white servant in North America in the 1680s was likewise to be understood as a trafficked subject. A migrant whose whiteness marked his or her fungibility, their capacity to be bought and sold wow rather than their rights as a political subject you hear that so this is again this is not what i expected not at all what i uh, expected um uh, the argument being that white racial grammar was not born uh white supremacist it became that way so then the question becomes how and why what led to that evolution and the article and the creation of an ideology of white victimhood and white power now, why is this not being known more widely in America? Why is this being swept under the rug? We have a gigantic industry in the United States and in the West, which is determined to limit black people to a slave mentality, to tell them you've been slaves, and the only way you're ever going to get out of that is to rely on the slave mentality of the socialistic welfare democratic system which is going to subsidize your manumission ever further. Well, as we know, no one ever gets out of his own bondage by someone else doing it for you. It's by your own work that you bring yourself out of bondage. Governor Northam made a reference to the history of slavery in the Commonwealth during his CBS interview, but he didn't call the first Africans to land on Virginia shores slaves. Take a listen. It has been a, a difficult week, and you know, if you look at Virginia's history, we're now uh, at the 400-year anniversary, uh, just 90 miles from here. Uh, in 1619, the first uh, indentured servants from Africa landed on our shores in Old Point Comfort, what we call now Fort Monroe. And while in 1619, the first uh, indentured servant, the first uh, indentured servant, the first uh, indentured servant, the first uh, indentured servant. And what did the elite do when you see that you're outnumbered by black and white folks who are penniless, landless, peasants? You have to do one of two things. You either have to kill them all, but you can't do that because who's going to work? Rich folks weren't going to. They had to get poor people to work. Whole point was to be a person of leisure back in those days. That was the goal 
was not to work. So you couldn't kill them all. You didn't want to kill them all. You had to do the work yourself. You had to build your own levy, build your own house. No, pick your own tobacco, harvest your own cotton. No, we're not going to do any of that. So you can't kill them, but you can co-opt them. And so the elite in Virginia, for example, in the colony, begins to give certain carrots to people of European descent saying things like, you know, we're going to let you own a little land, not much, but just a little. And we're going to get rid of indentured servitude. Now you're free labor. And by the way, once you're free labor, you get 50 acres of land just because you're free labor, see? So we're gonna cut you in on this deal. We're gonna let you enter into contracts. We're gonna let you testify in court. And here's the best of all, we're gonna put you on the slave patrol to keep those people in line, right? The idea was you're still gonna get your clock clean. We still don't like you. We still aren't gonna really empower you or change your economic subordination, but we're gonna make you honorary members of this team and you're gonna help us keep those other people down. And so they got a little taste of power and it did effectively divide and conquer those coalitions. Those rebellions began to stop almost instantly. So again, we're about to read from uh, this book from Benjamin Franklin. This is a throwback from the Black Jacobite video real quick. And it also helps us understand what we're gonna read today. Concerning the increase of mankind, peopling of countries uh, by Benjamin Franklin. All right, Benjamin Franklin wrote this, all right? This is from 1755. All right, and we're on page 10 of this book. And this is what Benjamin Franklin says, says point 24, which is making observations, right? He's given, which leads me to add one remark. He says that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionally very small. It's very small. You're the minority. All Africa is black or tawny. Asia, chiefly tawny, all right? Tawny, a darker complexion, right? Not, not white. America, exclusive of the newcomers, holy soul. All right, what is that saying? America is what? Black or tawny, holy soul. All right, Benjamin Franklin, and you know. And in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, Swedes are generally of what we call swarthy complexion. Swarthy. All right, just in case you don't know what swarthy is, and just a quick reminder, we're here in the American Dictionary of the English Language. All right, this is actually Webster's uh, 1828 uh, Dictionary. All right, I got the official PDF. We're going to go all the way to the word uh, swarthy. All right, and right here it says swart, right? Almost sounds like steward. Swart, steward, swart, steward. I would they get steward, did it mean black or dark? What is swart? It says being of dark hue, moderately black, tawny, swart. All right. Down here it says swart to make tawny or brown. Swart, an apparition. <laughs> Swartly. All right. Duskly with a tawny hue. It says swartness, tawniness, a dusky or dark complexion. Dark complexion, right? Dark complexion, swarty. Being of a dark hue or dusky complexion. Tawny. In warm climates, the complexion of men is universally what? Swarty or what? Black in warm climates. Is there only warm climates in Africa? No, we have warm climates all over the world, right? The Moors, Spaniards, and Italians are more swarty than the French, Germans, and English. This says their swarty hoes would darken all our plains. Swarty. All right, black, as the swarthy African says, right? As the swarthy African. So the African is swarthy, right? Swarthy is a tawny color. Swartish, somewhat dark or tawny. Swarthy, swarthy, tawny. All right? So you get the picture, right? Swarthy, so an African is swarthy, right? Black, right? So again, he said, Benjamin Franklin, that in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, Russians, French, Italians, Spaniards, and Swedes are generally of what we call a swarthy complexion, black complexion, as are the Germans. So is the Germans. So who's the real Quakers and Puritans that were coming over here? The Saxons only accepted who with the English make the principal body of white people on the face of the earth, he says, according to him, right? So he's saying that the Saxons and the English and his his English lineage, right? Not all of the English, we'll see later. I could wish their numbers were increased. He says, I wish there was more white people because it seems that all of Europe is basically swarthy. What do we have here, right here? This is uh, 
Runaway ad from the Pennsylvania Gazette, 1747. It says here, Runaway, the 22nd instant from James Greenfield of Newland Township, Chester County, an Irish servant man named Robert Clinton. Irish, right? A weaver by trade. He's a middle stature with black curled hair. Black curled hair and swarthy complexion. Hello. Hello. Black curled hair, swarthy complexion. Irish with black curled hair and swarthy complexion. What are they talking about here? Just let y'all think about that. All right? Look at this. Let's never teach them what Swarthy means, so they'll never know. <laughs> but we missed the, uh, you know, we're picturing Irish with red hair, red straight hair, blonde. No, sorry. This Irish got black curled hair, black curled hair, in a swarthy complexion and about 20 years of age he was young all right head on when he went away a new felt hat a dark brown coat a green jacket a flaxen shirt and a fine stock pole trousers of course he had that he's a european the so-called negroes are european why did so many so-called black people not go back to their indigenous African culture and clothing after they ran away and gave their kids instead of dressing like Europeans and giving their kids European names well they were Europeans they were just doing what was natural for them all right black curled hair swarthy complexion do you guys understand now so when we're talking about Irish being sent to the Caribbean Irish being sent to the plantations don't just assume pale skin white people yeah, this is deep. If you're in the islands, Jamaicans, you know, on any of those islands, Barbados, you got to really think about your ancestry. How deep it is. How much, how much Irish and Scottish could it be? Could it be? You got to go case by case, individual case by case, because you can't group everybody under one single thing. Because we have an Irish with black curl hair and swarthy complexion here, all right? All right, so we're in the Encyclopedia uh, Virginia .org, uh website, and it says here, Indentured Servants in Colonial Virginia, contributed by Brenda Wolfie and Martha McCarty. And it says, Indentured Servants for Men and Women Who Signed the Contract, also known as Indenture or a Covenant, by which they agreed to work for a certain number of years in exchange for transportation to Virginia. And once they arrived, food, clothing, and shelter. All right, so you see transportation to Virginia. So where they want us to assume they're talking about Europeans. You know, it doesn't really specify from where, right? But they're going to, you know, we're just, I guess in this article, they're just going to talk about Europeans or, you know, it doesn't say if they're white or more, you know, what kind of Europeans are coming Okay, so that's your own hijack. So it says adults usually served for four to seven years and children sometimes much longer. With most working in the colony's tobacco fields. Yeah, in the plantations, right? In tobacco plantations. His indentured servitude became during most of the 17th century, the primary means by which Virginia planters filled their nearly inexhaustible need for labor. That's how they filled these plantations, all right? At first, the Virginia Company of London paid to transport servants across the Atlantic. But with the institution of the head right system in 1618, the company enticed planters and merchants to incur the cost with the promise of land. Right, so I guess they promised them land after they were done. As a result, servants flooded into the colony. Servants, not slaves, where they were greeted by deadly diseases and often harsh conditions that killed a majority of newcomers and left the rest to the mercy of sometimes cruel masters. The General Assembly passed laws regulating contract terms, as well as the behavior and treatment of servants. Besides benefiting masters with long indentures, these laws limited servant rights, while still allowing servants to present any complaints in court. By the end of the 17th century, the number of new servants in Virginia had dwindled and the colony's labor needs were largely met by enslaved Africans. 
Gosh, the hijack. And so there are two sources of labor in colonial Virginia, the first of these being indentured servants. These were poor Europeans who agreed to a fixed term of forced labor in return for their passage across the Atlantic. So that's why it's called an indenture, because it's a type of contract between two individuals or groups. Well, at the very beginning, there were more indentured servants than African slaves. In fact, at the very beginning, there were zero African slaves. Zero. All right, so real quick, just to say, let's dodge the hijack with the African. But uh, you know, shout out to uh, Tom Ritchie for uh, you know this history lesson. And uh, again, as he was saying, you know, it was indentured servants. All right, in the beginning, there was no, no African slaves at all. There was no slaves. It was all indentured servants. Remember, and slavery, kind of uh, gradually became institutionalized in colonial Virginia until finally it was decided that slaves were the property of their masters for life. First, slaves were actually treated like indentured servants. All right, so this is the John Hopkins University Studies in Historical and Political Science by Herbert B. Adams, the editor. It says, history is past politics and politics are present history. Freeman, hmm, 13th series, all right? And it's called White Servitude in Virginia, yes, white servitude in Virginia. Oh, you thought it was just a little article here and there. You know, what is this? White servitude in colonial America. It says white servitude. Again, they're only saying white because they're Europeans, not because they're pale skinned. This is a modern interpretation of what they're trying to teach you in these books. So again, they're referring to all these Europeans collectively as white or white servitude. But we know, right? We've shown the evidence. We've shown the books. We've shown the genealogy. We've shown the historical coat of arms, the historical stewards, the historical so-called black nobility of Europe, right? And everybody else that was over there, the Huguenots, the Sephardic Jews, the Moors that got expelled, we've shown all that. What happened to them? All right, let's see. A study of the system of indentured labor in the American colonies by James Curtis Bala. All right, white servitude in the colony of Virginia, 1895. And we're in All right, so real quick again, the hijack, they're saying white servitude, they mean European servitude. All right? Not just pale skin. Yes, there was pale skin. Yes. But they're leaving out, they want you to assume, they want you to only picture pale skin people. So break the spell. All right? Wow. When I'm reading this, picture people of color going through this too. 10 in the introduction, it tells you that the object of the present paper then is to show. First, the purely colonial development of an institution which both legally and socially was, this, was distinct from the institution of slavery, which grew up independently by its side, though the two institutions mutually affected and modified each other to some degree. All right. Second, that it proved an important factor in the social and economic development of the colonies and conferred a great benefit on England and other portions of Europe and offering a partial solution of their problem of the unemployed. Now, remember, they were sending their undesirables, the poor people in the street, the bums, you know, homeless people, convicts. So they were getting rid of all these people. So they were finding a way to do that by putting them as indentured servants and sending them to America. So it says, when Lord Delaware came in 1610 with fresh supplies, he thoroughly organized the colony as a labor force under the commanders and overseers. Dale afterwards applied a rigorous military system adopted from the low countries and enforced it with great severity in carrying out his plans for establishing new plantations. The colonists were marched to their daily work in squads and companies under officers, people, colonists, Europeans, not, not talking about African slaves here. All right? And the severest penalties were prescribed for a breach of discipline or neglect of duty. A persistent neglect of labor was to be punished by galley service from one to three years penal servitude was also instituted for petty offenses. They worked as slaves in irons for a term of years in irons and chains. The planters affirmed that there were continual whippings and extraordinary punishments such as hangings. Hang, who's getting hanged first? You see, who's getting whipped? Hanged, all right? Shooting, breaking on the wheel, and even burning alive. They were burning these people alive, but it is likely they must exaggerate the state of affairs. 
Nashville. They were sending so many people here, even before 16, 19, since 16 or 7, they were trying to set this up. They had different ways they were trying to do it. This book explains. Eventually, the growth of a class of strictly indented servants was also a factor in the failure of this tenantship. Servants were much less costly and rapidly became more profitable. 50 servants were sent to serve the public in 1619, and in the next year, a hundred more, say the records, to be disposed of among the old planters, which they exceedingly desire, and will pay the company their charges with very great thanks. These men had been selected with great care, but the company was unfortunate in being forced by the repeated orders of King James, all right, good old King James, to add a number of dissolute persons whom he was determined by the exercise of a mere prerogative to remove from England as undesirable class. You see, he didn't want these people over there. They were sending them, they were dumping them over here in America, all these undesirable people. The new life which began in Virginia in the year 1619 greatly encouraged industry and husbandry and led to a large increase of independent proprietaries in a few years. Special inducements were offered by large grants of land and exceptional privileges to associations of planters and adventurers for the establishment of separate plantations. Liberal grants were also made to tradesmen and to members of the company in proportions to their shares to encourage immigration. Additional grants were made to them for every person transported to the colony in the next seven years. A large number of servants and tenants was needed on these plantations, and for some time the importation by private persons was larger than that by the company. All right, so they can't even count all the people that the, that were brought privately. You, you hear what they're saying, right? So now we come to the modern period, and we have this absurd stereotype which denotes black skin with servitude. And it's absurd. It's a folly. So I'm bringing the good news to black people that they are not of any more of a slave race than whites have been. Well, white slaves had to endure hundreds of lashes, and many of them died of that. But another way of penalizing them was to add time onto their length of service. If you were ran away a day, that was a month of additional service. If you ran away for a month, that was a year of additional service. If you stole from your master, that could be months of additional service. If you had a corrupt master and the courts listened, the courts of Assis listened more to the master than they did to you, he could have all kinds of trumped up charges against you, as happened in the Caribbean and as happened in the United States and the tobacco plantations. And it meant that in reality, it boiled down to a lifetime of enslavement under the euphemism of indentures. A lifetime of enslavement under the euphemism of indentures. Oh. No. All right, so we're in this other book, all right? I had to borrow this, couldn't even download this. You know, they don't want even, even want you to have this. So it says, White Servitude in Colonial America, an Economic Analysis by David Gelson. Again, European servitude. White servitude was one of the major institutions in the economy and society of colonial British America. Major institution, white servitude, indentured English men and women constituted the principal labor supply for many of the early British settlements in the New World. All right. We're not talking about Africans. They told you all your life it was Africans. All right. But that was wrong. That's Kunta Kinte. That's roots, uh, fictional stories, plagiarized fictional stories. And their successors continued to make up an important part of white immigration to the British colonies in America throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. All right. They were coming in as what? Servants, indentured servants. All right. Yet those bound immigrants who arrived in the West Indies or the Chesapeake in the first half of the 17th century performed a very different role in the colonial labor market. Then did the indentured servants who came to British America in the middle of the 18th century. This book provides a description of the evolution of the economic function of white servitude in colonial America based on an examination of detailed evidence about the population of bound immigrants and analysis the sources of this process through the use of an explanatory framework designed to provide an understanding of the determinants of the major changes 
that occurred over in time in the composition of colonial labor forces. In this way, this book is intended to produce both a thorough portrayal and an explanation of the causes underlying a dramatic episode of early American history in which hundreds of thousands of European men and women of the 17th and 18th century voluntarily sold themselves into bondage for a period of years in order to become part of the earliest stream of immigrants from the old world to the new. All right. Again, did you understand that? Hundreds of thousands of Europeans, they came in as what? Into bondage. They came into, they volunteered themselves into bondage, into Egypt. They came back into Egypt, right? Into bondage for a period of years. Contract to become part of the early stream of immigrant. Slavery, slavery played no part in the plans of the early colonizers of British America, right? Slavery wasn't around. It didn't exist. It wasn't in their mind. They came in with their English laws, which was indentured servitude. They also copied this from the Spaniards, their encomienda and repartimiento system that they had with the as aborigines as well in the islands and Central America and Mexico, South America. Again, slavery played no part in the plans of the early colonizers of British America. The use of bound white laborers preceded the use of black slaves. So the use of bound white laborers preceded the use of black slaves in every British American colony, in every colony, all right? In a constitutional system dedicated to the defense of legalized chattel slavery in our constitution in 1789 could become transformed into an abolitionist project in 1865. That accomplishment was neither easy nor inevitable it was a product of sustained resistance, ideological battle, consciousness raising, brilliant organizing, and ultimately a war of national liberation and preservation led by black citizen slaves and white freemen. But few commentators have spent much time pondering the significance of the abolition of indentured servitude in the 13th Amendment. That omission seems reasonable when we consider that few indentured servants remained in the United States in 1865 as most courts had refused to criminalize breach of contract um, after the 1830s. And yet the abolition of indentured servitude, along with slavery, of course, would have profound implications and consequences for the American nation. For starters, consider the dramatic divergence between the, great, between the United States and Great Britain, uh, its anti-slavery rival, uh, which after its abolition of slavery in 1833, uh, enlivened regimes of indenture and expanded global systems of unfree labor across its empire and across the 19th century. Consider also the power of an anti-trafficking coalition within uh, the 13th Amendment. By anti-trafficking, I mean the abolition of buying and selling people, which is not the same as slavery, but certainly is commensurate with it. That is, in fact, uh, what is so startling about the 13th Amendment in many respects is that it abolished both kinds of um, traffic. Uh, linked explicitly here for the first time in U.S. law were the common interests of indentured servants and slaves in not being bought or sold. You can read the servant and slave codes from their origin as trying to drive a wedge between servants and slaves. And here in the 13th Amendment, they come together beautifully. All right, I know it sounds like a little mumbo jumbo there, but the guy is going to get to a point later on, and we're going to read it as well. But he's basically letting us know that these first abolitionists, we're going to read later on, you know, the whole American Revolutionary War, it had a purpose. And the main reason these people's freedom, the freedom they were really fighting for, it was their indenture. They were bound, bounded. Most of these people were convicts, prisoners. We're just beginning right now. We're going to read all this. They were fighting for their freedom. It wasn't about no country and, oh, let's fight for America. And No, they were fighting for their own freedom. A lot of these people got land grants after the, the time of the war. All right, so that was their indenture to come fight in the war. That was how they paid their transportation over here. And if they survived, they got land. A lot of these people ended up in the southeast of U.S. today, where there is so-called black communities today. And been black communities for like 200 years right so where did they, all these uh 
indentured servant people, these uh, American revolutionary hero soldiers that got land grants all over the, uh, these areas. If they're white, where do they go, all of them? Should be more white. Where did these slaves come from? Where were they drawn from? Well, primarily from Great Britain. Uh, it, was, it was remarked in uh, one of the chronicles that I found that Scotland was a veritable industry for white slavery. Uh, in the 17th century, white parents were afraid to bring their children to the ports of Scotland for fear of what has come to be known as press gangs. Again, the historians have distorted this and implied that impressment only operated for uh, recruiting people on board British men of war as sailors. That's not true. In the original annals, you find that press gangs operated to kidnap children and adults on board these ships. And it was a veritable industry with the cooperation of the authorities. It began uh, in the very early or the very late Elizabethan era when the Elizabethan uh, geographer Halcutt suggested that the only way they were going to people these plantations was with bondsmen. But the actual machinery of it and where it was really put into effect en masse came in the Stuart dynasty and under uh, the King Charles I in the early 17th century. We're going to get the info now that we're clear that not all Europeans were white. There was many, many so-called black Europeans, and a lot of these were the ones getting caught in this indenture middle passage, this involuntary or voluntary middle passage, prisoners of war, convicts, you know, colonization, you, you know, all right? So let's get on with the info. All right, so now I want to get into uh, this book. Uh, it's called, well, it's written by Bernard Balin. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author of Voyagers to the West. And this particular book we're getting into is called The Barbarous Years, The Peopling of British North America, The Conflict of Civilizations, 1600-1675. So what I did is I bought the Kindle version because they don't show you any preview of it and it's hard to get anywhere. So, you know, thanks to uh, your donations, you know, I'm able to get stuff. So, so we begin here, it says the third group of Anglo-Dutch religious radicals to settle in Virginia was initially the most tragic all right so what are they talking about so anglo-dutch religious radicals uh you know these are indentured servants most of them of the 180 passengers from the embattled elder francis blackwell led from amsterdam to virginia no fewer than 130 including blackwell himself died on that voyage of seven months they had been packed together it was reported like herrings they had amongst them the flux and also want of fresh water. So as it is here, London wondered at that so many are alive, then that so many are dead. All right, so again, they were what packed together like herons. Talking about people packed in ships, we ain't talking about Africans. Or if you want to talk about a slave ship and people, uh, a middle passage, right? So you got to include these people too. And they all died too. Now, were all these white people? That's to the bait. They're talking about Anglo Dutch religious radicals. That doesn't talk about complexion right there. Continuing down here, it says the horror of Blackwell's notorious voyage was only an extreme example of the miseries of the transportation and res resettlement process of those years. For most of the voyagers, emigration was a shocking experience. For some, it was as deadly as it was for Blackwell's pilgrims. The Virginia Company published guidelines for the supplies necessary for such voyages, but did nothing to enforce them, with the result that the provisions on board were so poor that they became a subject of complaint to the Privy Council. The voyages of these small, ill-equipped rocking vessels lasted two or three months. Food and drink were bad. Stinkish beer and quality and short in quantity Sanitation was primitive, and sickness swept through the passengers like deadly storms. So, you, you hear this? Each year, each shipping season, many died at sea. Most of the carefully recruited iron workers were lost on a single voyage. Okay, we're not talking about Africans here in this moment. The survivors were so weakened by disease and exhaustion 
fact that they quickly fell victim to debilitating attacks of dysentery and other afflictions. Whole shiploads that had been sent over to work on various public enterprises had to be transferred to whatever private plantations would take them simply to assure their survival. You hear this? And the guest houses of which Sandy spoke so happily did not exist. Only one building, 40 feet by 20, is known to have been built for that purpose. And so since it is mortal for newcomers to lie on the ground, the hundreds of new arrivals had to be added to the crowds that already filled the small flimsy dwellings that were being hastily constructed. Even that might have been tolerable if the timing of the voyages had been right. But despite bitter protests from Virginia, the vessels typically left England early in the spring and arrived at the worst possible time at the beginning of the hot season and, be and before the year's harvest had come in. So they would send these people right when it was time to actually gather the harvest and, and go, you know, go into winter. They actually needed these people more. It would be more logical to send them and during the springtime when they're planted so they can help out, right? Partake in, in, in the work and, and get their uh, fruits from it. The constant, often unexpected arrivals of shiploads after shiploads of sickly, disoriented passengers in a climate that was debilitatingly hot and humid, lacking supplies to carry them over the first phase of resettlement, destined to be housed in crowded huts until they could be distrib distributed often to places other than their intended destinations. All of this brought repeated outcries from the resident leaders. I pray Sir Governor George Yearly, 1618-21, wrote Sandys, give me both time to provide means and to build and, and settle before you send one load after another. Stop sending these ships, they're telling him, man. Give us some time. I'm talking about, we're talking about ships after ships, right? Ship load after ship load not talking about slave ships from Africa here I'm talking about Europeans coming as indentured servants convicts undesirables all right but let's not forget all this we continue in chapter five of this book and right here it says the English who both repelled and attracted the Indians as they probed their exposed borders continued to lead fragile disordered lives in an unfamiliar dangerous environment pressing against threatening people no less disoriented and fearful than themselves. The settlers were still sheltered in a small, lightly built dirt floor dwellings scattered half as early and amid crudely cultivated stump field tobacco fields and cattle farms, some with produce, gardens, small fields of corn and other crops cut out of Indian hunting grounds. Most of them were servants, slaves. All right, parentheses, you see that? Most of them, what, were servants, these settlers, these English, these were slaves. They were frequently called working of their indentures. They were working of what? Their indentures. They were what? Servant slaves, often side by side with their masters, hoping eventually to acquire a parcel of tobacco land of their own or return to their original homes. So as the African among them, oh, that's the hijack. All right, the reason I say that is because when was this written? In 2012, published. So they're going to add the African in there when they're talking about people of color. It says the African among them, 23 in 1625, because there's no record of any Africans in six. Show me slave voyages. Go to slavevoyages.org right now and show me any African in 1625. A ship. And, and bringing in any Africans in 1625. You won't find that. It says... They were of indeterminate legal status since they had no contracts and their social status, though, the base was unclear. So wait a minute. They have no contracts and you don't know their status. So you can't say they're a slave because you don't know. It's unclear. They have no contracts. They sound like free people of color to me. That's what they sound like to me. If it's unclear and this has scholarly footnotes. Right, this book is very scholarly. His sources are very scholarly. You can follow up on this, on that if you like. All right, they don't know. It's unclear. So again, drop nation. If they can't tell you who you are, how can they tell you who you're not? The social order 
as a whole in the struggling colonies, pell-mell scramble for survival and profits was chaotic. To continue on page 80 of this book, it says these large quantities of tobacco were not produced on the company's land, and the laborers necessary to produce these crops were not as originally planned. Employees of the Virginia company, they were contract workers on an increasing number of private plantations created by the company New Land Policy and tenant farmers of absentee landowners assisted by indentured servants, all right, indentured servants, all right, that's who by 1617, a model structure had emerged, all right? They had the plan, they had, oh, they had the blueprint. We need, we need to do this with indentured servants. We're gonna get them from the undesirables and the convicts we don't want and all those poor people we don't want over there. Adventurers do land for their investments began to pool their grants to create larger and more efficient units of production. Smith's 100 founded that year, which combined the land claims of leading figures in the company, became a virtual colonizing company of its own financed by a terminable joint stock and complete with a private labor force of indentured servants, a private labor force of indentured servants, not African slaves. We're talking about plantations, we're talking about tobacco plantations, indentured servants. And this included also American Aboriginal Indians they were bringing in from the Caribbean and local ones they had already put into servitude and indentured. Right, so when they show us these tobacco fields with so-called Negroes, you know, growing it, you know, it's not Africans. This was done with indentured servants. So Dutch the hijack. This is real history. All right, so now we're on page uh, 130. And we're going to talk about uh, the passengers on this ship, the Ark and the Dove. All right, it's about uh, 1634. We're gonna to go to the next page. It talks about the list. It says the rest of the passengers, most of them Protestants, right? Protestants, remember who's the Protestants? We got we already know. So remember, we're indentured or paid servants. So remember when they're telling us Protestants settled here, religious uh, freedom, well, they had to find a way to get over. It wasn't like they all had money to come over. So they had to indenture themselves for the passage over here. So these Protestants were indentured or paid servants. One of them black. One of them, a Protestant, one of them black. What does that mean? So-called black. One of the Protestants is black. One, a Portuguese mulatto, a Portuguese mulatto, some artisans and a few independent farmers. Now, are we supposed to assume that this one black, supposedly one black is an African? That's the hijack, right? They're letting you know something here. Two Jesuit priests, Andrew White and John Alton, and a lay brother completed the shipboard list sharply divided between gentry and laborers, most of whom were indentured servants. The first settling group conformed reasonably well to Calvert's social expectations. 165 of this book, it says approximately 100,000 Britons of the great majority English are known to have migrated to the Tobacco Coast in the 17th century. All right. Britons in the Tobacco Coast, Britons, not Africans, at least 70% of them and probably 85% came as indentured servants, 85% slaves, bonded for service. They were at work in the oldest settled areas as in the newest, arriving year after year on veritable convoys of ships from the major English ports, Middlesex County, between the Potomac and the Rappahannock rivers, a contemporary road was a sea of servants. All right, a sea of servants. We're not talking about Africans. 45% of that country's entire population were servants in 1668. And the same could have been said of other countries. Who were these tens of thousands of voluntary bonded servants? Tens of thousands, hundred thousands. Where are their descendants? This is a lot of people, imagine. So why would they need if they're hiring contracts, you know, why would they be doing that if they got free labor from Africans? It's a business. It's a corporation, you see? Who were the tens of thousands of voluntary bonded servants? Where were they from? And where and, and were their backgrounds? What were their backgrounds? What were the differences and similarities among them? How did they live in this strange environment? What would become of them when they were released from service? The in the book says the most debased, possibly 40% of the total, were the youngest, the least skilled and most destitute. They shipped out without the protection of legal indentures and served, therefore, according to the harsh terms of extemporized contracts that followed Virginia's local custom. 
And we're on page 308 of this uh, book, and this part is talking about uh, our travails uh, in Fort Christina, a settlement renamed to Altona. And it says that the population, about 600 souls, many of them rough people, as poor as worms and lazy with all. Only a few of them qualified farmers fell victim to the damp climate made more miserable by a sequence of heavy rains that ruined the winter fodder. A hot intermittent fever and dysentery became epidemic. About 100 people, many of them children, died, and the diseases were compounded by the arrival of 108 more settlers on the mill. So on top of what they were going through, they were dumping more comics, more people with disease, more people undesirables on top of them. All right. 11 of whose companions had succumbed to scurvy on the passage, three of whom died on landing. The survivors, especially the indentured orphan children, indentured, taken from Amsterdam's almshouses, were suffering from a variety of illnesses, some contagious, and they brought with them no supplies. But recruitment continued in Finland and especially in the farming districts of Gelderland in Holland. All right. We're talking about Dutch, German, Finnish uh, people, indentured servants too. These type of Europeans, not just English, Scottish, or Irish. Remember, all of Europeans were bringing over here. In the book, uh, Redemptioners and Indentured Servants in the Colony and Commonwealth of Pennsylvania by Carl Frederick Geyser from 1901. A single example from the Pennsylvania Gazette on May 9, 1751, may here serve as a characteristic illustration. And it says, from that time, uh, an ad, right? It says, run away from Thomas James of Upper Marion, Philadelphia County. On the 5th of this instant, inst an Irish servant lad named William Dubbin, about 18 years of age, speaks good English, fresh colored and thick and well set in his body, has light colored curled hair, somewhat resembling a wig, hat on when he went away an old felt hat, Ozenbrick shirt and old dark brown colored coat, too big for him and breeches of the same, gray worsted stockings, and a pair of old shoes with brass buckles, one of the buckles broke. Whoever takes up and seizes this servant so that his master may have him again shall have 20 shillings reward and reasonable charges paid by Thomas Jones. And we continue in the book, White Servitude in the Colony of Virginia, a study of the system of indentured labor in the American colonies, all right? 1895, I believe. We're in chapter two now. The servitude thus developed was limited and conditional. With respect to its origin, it was of two kinds, resting on distinct principles. First, voluntary servitude based on free contract with the London company or with private persons for definite terms of service in consideration of the servant's transportation and maintenance during servitude. Second, involuntary servitude, where legal authority condemned a person to a term of servitude judged necessary for his reformation or prevention from an idle course of life or as a reprieve from other punishment for misdemeanors already committed. All right. So again, they were sending convicts or they were picking up these spiriting, actually kidnapping, spirited these people, uh, you know, involuntarily and sending them to America, dumping them over here. Convicts, poor people, undesirables. So though involuntary on the part of the servant, this kind involved a contract. So even though these people were being forced to come over here involuntarily, they still were getting a contract, imposing the sentence and the person that undertook the transportation of the offender. And the master's right to service resting upon the terms of this contract made or assigned to him was practically on the same footing as involuntary servitude. The great body of servants was comprised in the former class. They were free persons, largely from England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. You hear this? All right. These are your slaves. These are your first indentured servants who wished to go to the colony as settlers to better their condition, but were too poor to bear the charges of their transportation. They consequently entered into a voluntary contract with anyone that would assume these charges and their maintenance for such a term of years as would repay the outlay, placing themselves for this limited time at the disposal of the person for any reasonable service. The contract was made in Great Britain with resident planters or the agents of colonists but more frequently with shipmasters who traded in Virginia and disposed of the servant on their arrival as they saw fit. The agreement was by deed indented and hence arose the term indented servants. This class of so-called kids was supplemented by a smaller class of persons 
who went on agreements for fixed wages for a definite time. The other large class was supplied chiefly from English paupers, vagrants, and dissolute persons sent under the arbitrary exercise of royal prerogative or by court sentences and later by the action of English penal statutes. In the earlier years, it included a large number of poor children from the counties and towns of England who were sent to apprenticeship on easy conditions. The penal regulations of the colony up to the year 1642 tended also to recruit this class. A very large number of the convicts sent to the American plantations were political and not social criminals. Of the Scotch prisoners taken at the Battle of Worcester, 1610 were sent to Virginia in 1651. Two years later, 100 Irish Tories were sent, and in 1685, a number of the followers of Monmouth that had escaped the cruelties of Jeffreys. Many of the Scotch prisoners of Dunbar and of the rebels of 1666 were sent to New England and other plantations. As early as 1611, Governor Dale, anxious to fill out the number of 2,000 men for establishing military posts along James River, had recommended that all convicts from the common jails be kept up for three years. They are not always, he said, the worst kind of men, either for birth, spirit, or body, and would be glad to escape a just sentence and make this their new country. Oh, they would be glad to not be criminals anymore and get to go free in America so they can do their <laughs> criminal acts over there, right? And plan therein with all diligence, cheerfulness, and comfort. Yeah, sure. Not all these comics were good, I don't think. This request passed unheeded, and the earliest introduction of any of the criminal class seems to have been in 1618. All right? They're sending criminals over here. A strict system of search was applied to every ship that entered Virginia ports, and for the next half century, the colony had a respite from this class of new gators and jailbirds. The transportation was now diverted to the West Indies. Also, it's not like they stopped sending them. They just started sending them to the West Indies instead. But this proved so ineffectual in putting a stop to petty felonies that in the fourth year of George I, 1717, Parliament passed a statute over the most vigorous protest from the Virginia merchants in London, making the American colonies practically a reformatory and a dumping ground for the felons of England. So they brought it back in 1717. Nope, that is the dumping ground for the felons of England. Again, pay attention, people, please. Remember this. When you see an American who says, oh, I, I, I descend from England, right? Well, your, your ancestor might have been a felon, and he was <laughs> dumped here. He was considered a felon in England. He was dumped here because he was a felon. Damn, they needed to work. They needed to take servants. <laughs> so you can tell them that. Have you done your genealogy and studied that? Ask them that. All right, because this was a dumping ground for the felons of England. All right, this is an official scholarly book with sources, real history here. In 1766, the benefits of this act were extended to include Scotland through Benjamin Franklin on the part of Pennsylvania, memorialized Parliament against it, and in 1768, the more speedy transportation of felons was ordered. Look at how many felons they're sending over here. So how many of these indentured servants that came here, how many really were felons? Wow. You see why they came here with that evilness, with that nature, to not care to take your town, to kill you, take your whole, you know, rape your women, eat up all your corn, not care, dig up your graves, eat eat them, right? Like eat your ancestors because they were so hungry, going hungry, digging up your graves and stuff. The stuff they did, all right, these felons. The practice was only stopped by the War of the Revolution. The preamble of the Act of 1779 significantly remarks that whereas the transportation of felons to His Majesty's American colonies is attended with many difficulties, they are now to be sent to other parts beyond the sea, whether situated in America or not. All right, when another book from the John Hopkins University Studies in Historical and Political Science, and this is White Servitude in Maryland, 1634 to 1820 by Eugene Irvin McCormick, Ph.D., instructor in American History, University of California. And this is from 1904. As nearly all indentures were negotiable, they were regularly disposed of at auction or private sale. The following is an example of the notices which appeared in the papers whenever a servant ship arrived in port 
says here, just arrived in the ship Sophia, Alexander Berdine, master from Dublin, 20 stout, healthy, indented men, servants with 20 people, it says, whose indentures will be disposed of on reasonable terms by the captain on board or the subscriber, etc. The prize received for servants varied according to their skill, age, and other personal qualities, but the average price for adults seems to have been about 15 to 20 pounds, all right? People from Europe being sold, right? Like property, people being sold. The Jews and Moors in Spain, Spain, Iberia. This is by Rabbi Joss Kruskov, chapter 17. The dispersion of the Jews. Thus mournfully closed the last chapter. These are sad words fraught with anguish and despair. Yet however sad, however despondent and hopeless, however much of grief and anguish and despair they convey, they befell the Jews of Spain, and they fell altogether. When they are asked to describe the sufferings and miseries which met the unfortunate exiles everywhere, and their fruitless search for a quiet spot where they might live or die in peace, ships stood ready in the harbors to carry nearly all of the banished 300,000 Jews, whithersoever it suited the captains best. All right, so again, these are moderate numbers. Because we're talking about they were very prosperous for hundreds of years with the Moors. All right. So we have others, you know, scholars that will question these numbers and talk about millions, right? Now it says here, into these ships, exiles were literally packed, all right, literally packed in ships, crowded together without regard to sex or age. Often mother torn from child, husband from wife, brother from sister, friends from friends, and separated on the coast meant separation forever. Words and the heart fail me to speak of the heart-rending cries of parent for child and child for parent, of husband for wife and wife for husband, or of the wailing and lamenting as Spain, the land of their birth. The home of their comfort and luxury and blessings. All right, Spain, not Africa, right? Spain, not Africa, Spain, place of their birth. Slowly faded out of sight and finally disappeared beneath the horizon. All right, now you tell me if that don't sound like what happened to Kunta Kinte and the so called African slave stories, how they were snatching people separating families babies from their moms all right now we're talking about real history here so this is further on in the book what they were doing to them when they were putting them in the ships it says no sooner were they on high sea when men and women and children were ordered on deck commanded to this row publicly regardless of innocence of youth and modesty of sex many a virgin and many a youth many a husband and many a wife there to resist not that they had money concealed, but for shame's sake. And the raging billows rocked them into their eternal sleep for their resistance. All right, they killed them. Disappointed in their search, their thirst for gold was more excited. Body after body they ripped open. Before the eyes of unfortunate exiles and the belief that they must have swallowed their gold and precious jewels. And disappointed in this, there followed a scene, a more detestable and dusterly one the sun never shone upon all right you hear that cruelty going on these are people of color right from spain it says when the sailors had finally satiated their brutal lust upon the innocence and helpless and faint from terror and torture and when the still surviving victims had been made to cleanse the ships from every trace of the blood of their friends and kin they were seized and dropped into the ocean without a pang of conscience and as unconcernedly as if the great God had created Jews for no other purpose but to appease the beastly appetites of inhuman sailors and serve as food for the fishes of the sea. All right. Again, these Catholics are doing this, right? It's a religious warfare. It's deep. It's not about complexion. Another captain was somewhat more merciful. Whether he had to expiate, expiate some of his tender hardness by humiliating penance ecclesiastical history has neglected neglected to record he set all his exiles on the shore upon a desert coast 
leaving the weak and the suffering pitilessly a prey to wild beasts and to starvation. One of these unfortunate deserted exiles who survived tells us how he saw his wife perish before his eyes, how he himself fainted with exhaustion, and upon awakening beheld his two children dead by his side. For weeks, roots and grass furnished their food. Each day brought fresh miseries and fresh graves. These were days such as Shakespeare speaks of. Each new morning, new windows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strife, heaven on the face. Says mothers unable to bear the pinning of their children struck them dead. All right. I know a lot of you read scripture. Hey, I don't know if this is sounding familiar. So mothers unable to bear the pinning of their children struck them dead and then took their own life. Whole families folded themselves in love and embrace and while thus embracing ended their life with their own hand. When the wind beast came upon them, the exiles plunged into the sea and stood shivering in the water for hours and hours until the beast retreated. Warily they made their way onward until at last they beheld the joyous sight of human settlements. Exhausted they lay along the coast wasted by suffering and disease, and half demented from starvation. Down to the shore came the priest, and holding a crucifix in one hand, and provisions in the other, the unfortunate Jews were given the choice between Christ and starvation. So you choose Christ or you die. Convert or die. That's the Inquisition. Another shipload was cast out by a barbarous captain, upon the African coast. So listen to this. People, Sephardic Jews being brought to African coast, right? A reversed, where the African savages pounced down upon them and abandoned themselves to fight for cruelties. You heard what happened when they dumped them in Africa? West Africa, where they're supposed to, you know, a lot of these Hebrew Israelite camps, you know, attacking me, telling me, Oh, you're uh, you know, they're coming from what you know, it's actually in reverse a lot of this time. You know, a lot of those were Sephardic Jews that we that were being taken as slaves or just servants or just being dumped in West Africa, you know. The men and Jews they sold into slavery. The defenseless women were brutally ravished. You know what that means. The children of their mother's breast, the aged and the sick and the infirm were mutilated and tortured and murdered by the thousands. That's on the African coast. Another shipload landed in the harbor of Genoa, all right, Italy. A graphic picture of their suffering is given by Genoese, Genoese historian and eyewitness of the scenes, which he describes as follows. No one says he could behold the sufferings of the Jewish exiles unmoved. A great many perished of hunger, especially those of tender years. Mothers with scarcely enough strength to support themselves, carried their famished infants in their arms and died with them. Many fell victims to the cold, others to intense thirst, while the unaccustomed distress incident to a sea voyage aggravated their maladies. All right, so we're in this other book now. Uh, by Don Jordan and Michael Walsh, and it's called White Cargo, The Forgotten History of Britain's White Slaves in America. We're just talking about European servitude. They slaughtered in America for gold. The English in America had to plant for their wealth. Failing to find the expected mineral riches along the eastern seaboard, they turned to farming, hoping they can make gold from tobacco. They needed a compliant sub servient, preferably free labor force, and since the indigenous peoples of America were difficult to enslave, they turned to their own homeland to provide. Right, they got their own English slaves, not Africans. They imported Britons deemed to be surplus people. All right, Britons, they're talking about, they're talking about the originals, the dark skin. All right. Remember, I know they, they're talking about white people here, but they also imported anybody who they didn't want. So that even black Britons too. The rootless, the unemployed, the criminals, and the dissident, and held them in the Americas in various forms of bondage for anything from three years to life. This book tells the story of these victims of empire. They were all supposed to gain their freedom eventually. For many, it didn't work out that way. In the early decades, half of them died in bondage. This book tracks the evolution of the system in which tens of thousands of whites, whites, not Africans, were held as chattel 
marketed like cattle, not Africans, whites, punished brutally and in some cases literally worked to death. For decades, this underclass was treated just as savagely as black slaves and indeed toiled, suffered, and rebelled alongside them. Right, whites running away, getting hanged, you know, getting uh, whipped, lashes, all that. Eventually, a racial wedge was trust between white and black. Something happened, leaving blacks officially enslaved and whites apparently upgraded, but in reality, just as enslaved as they were before. You understand what happened? Eventually, there was a racial wedge, and among the first to be sent were children. Some were dispatched by impoverished parents seeking a better life for them, but others were forcibly deported, forcibly. In 1618, the authorities in London began to sweep up hundreds of troublesome urchins from the slums and ignoring protests from the children and their families shipped them to Virginia. England's richest man was behind this mass expulsion. It was presented as an act of charity. The starving children were to be given a new start as apprentices in America. In fact, they were sold to planters to work in the fields, and half of them were dead within a year. Shipments of children continued from England and then from Ireland for decades. Many of these migrants were little more than toddlers. In 1661, the wife of a man who imported four Irish boys into Maryland as servants wondered why her husband had not brought some cradles to have rocked them in as they were so little. A second group of forced migrants from the mother country were those such as vagrants and petty criminals, all right? They were sending mad criminals over here whom England's rulers wished to get rid of. The legal ground was prepared for their relocation by highwaymen turned Lord Chief Justice who argued for England's gauls to be emptied in America. Thanks to men like him, 50,000 to 70,000 convicts, all right, or maybe more, were transported to Virginia, Maryland, Barbados, and England, other American possessions before 1776, all right, before 1776. All manner of others considered undesirable by the British crown were also dispatched across the Atlantic to be sold in servitude. They ranged from beggars to prostitutes, Quakers to cavaliers. All right, all the people, anybody they didn't want over there, undesirable. So they were sending them too. They were undesirable. So a lot of you people got, you know, whatever, English, Irish, you know, in your family uh, census and you go back to English people. They might have been actually so-called black people, not white people. These were black indentured Europeans. All right. White races. And there were still people profiting from white bondage. Uh, what did end with the beginning of the American Revolutionary War against the British crown was transportation, which is a technical term used by the British for bringing uh, so-called white criminals from Britain and dumping them in the United States. Benjamin Franklin uh, greatly protested that, and that was, in fact, one of the colonists' grievances. However, I believe that it was also an alibi because the Waltham Black Act of 1723 had uh, criminalized a, a great number of petty misdemeanors and made them capital offenses. In other words, Britain was teeming with a white population of poor people that it couldn't handle, and it needed to get them off the island. So by criminalizing these petty offenses, you were then able to say, we sentence you to death. However, as for stealing a teaspoon or a loaf of bread or cutting down uh, trees on an aristocrat's uh, grounds or poaching a deer, However, as a mercy of the British crown, we will transport you for life into slavery in the British crown colony of America. When the American Revolution erupted, the British crown then had to switch their dumping ground from America to Australia. And that's how Australia was founded. All right. So before we continue, I just wanted to, uh, I know it was really quick. He mentioned that uh, Benjamin Franklin was complaining about this. Uh, how they were just bringing all these Germans and Europeans and all that. I don't know if you guys remember, right? Benjamin Franklin was actually saying these were swarthy. Why are we going to Germanize America with more German, swarthy Germans with these Boers? He called them Boers. And uh, he said the Scottish, the Spanish, all these people were swarthy. He said America was swarthy as well. He said all of Asia was swarthy. All right, so he just mentioned them. And yes, he did do that. You can look that up. Again, we're just learning about a true middle passage here. 
We just learned about the true middle passage here. Let's continue. And this book is called Colonist in Bondage, White Servitude and Convict Labor in America, 1607 to 1776. Now, it reaches that year, but we know that it actually continued after that. Abbott Emerson Smith is the author. It says, a search and exploration of a very profitable and frequently criminal trade and its impact on colonial life before the revolution. So we're in part one again, chapter one, indenture servants and retentioneers. This book is about those white people who went to the British colonies in North America and who, because they were unwilling or unable to pay the cost of their own passage, became bond servants for a period of years to some colonial master who paid it for them. All right, so we've already gone over this. We understand now what indenture servitude and, and the whole passage and why they had to um, be bound or be servants for seven years because they couldn't pay for it on their own. And doesn't always mean that these people were willingly coming either. So a lot of these people were being forced. So they somebody had to pay for their transportation, all right? They were variously known as indentured servants, redemptioneers, or in order to distinguish them from the Negroes as Christians or white servants. Many of them were convicts from the jails, transported instead of being hanged. A few were political and military prisoners, taken in war or rebellion. There were rogues, vagabonds, whores, cheats, and rabble of all descriptions, racked from the gutter and kicked out of the country. All, right? all their undesirables, all these people they were just trying to get rid of, criminals, all these people, man, that they were just dumping over here. It's no wonder why they did the things they did when they got here. There were unfortunate French, German, and Swiss Protestants. Fleeing from religious persecution, starving and unhappy Irish, rack-rented Scottish farmers, poverty-stricken German peasants and artisans, brash adventurers of all sorts. People of every age and kind were decoyed, deceived, seduced, and bagled or forcibly kidnapped and carried as servants to the plantation, all right? They were kidnapping people. Now, they told you they were going to Africa kidnapping people, all right? Now you see why this dude who wrote Roots, the original, I'm talking about the African, the one Alex Haley plagiarized, where he get all these ideas from? People getting kidnapped and brought to America to work in a plantation. This was happening to white people first, Europeans first, first. I'm not talking about Slavery, I'm talking about in the Americas. When you're talking about setting up a colony, setting up an economy, building a town, you need them free labor. In the Americas, this was done with indentured service, not African slaves, not in the beginning. And even at the end, we already know <laughs> there is no proof. Where's the slave ship? You guys were already here. They were grabbing you from here. You had They had the labor force here. They didn't have to go spend money bring a ship all the way to Africa, risk the adventure, the company, the business, and then bring Africans over here when you were already here. All right? They made you into indentured servant. They did that to the end. You know, we already got all these videos. Got like five videos on that with all scholarly sources. Go back if you're new to my channel. There were many ordinary individuals of decent substance. And a few even who were entitled by the custom of time to be called gentle. All right, so he's trying to water it down a little bit. He said, well, there were some regular people. <laughs> More than half of all persons who came to the colonies south of New England were servants. Again, you're a white American. You're most likely a descendant of a servant, a convict, or anything like that that was sent over here, a vagabond. You know, you read. From the complex pattern of forces produced in emigration, to the American colonies, one stands out clearly as most powerful in causing the movement of servants. This was the pecuniary profit to be made by shipping them, shipping them, put them in ships. Labor was one of the few European importations which even the earliest colonies would sacrifice much to procure, and the system of indentured servitude was the most convenient system next to slavery by which labor became a commodity to be bought and sold. Labor or your service was a commodity to be bought and sold. It was profitable for English merchants trading to the colonies to load their outgoing ships with a cargo of servants. Load what? Their ships? Load their ships with servants? What servants? English, Irish, Scottish, all these undesirables. Not Africans. 
for the labor of these servants could be transferred to colonial planters at a price well above the cost of transporting them. It was profitable to the colonial planter to buy them, for he could rise from mere subsistence to prosperity only by commanding the labor of others beside himself. Hence, there was a constantly active stimulant to the emigration of servants, a powerful and resourceful group of merchants and shippers always ready to accept the services of volunteers for the new world, and what was more important, to bring pressure to bear on doubtful candidates to advertise the attractions of life in America, and even as a last resort, to collect a shipload of labor by forceful means. All right, they were advertising, making a scene, giving a good picture of America, the American dream, and you can be successful, you can be free, you won't be a convict, you won't be a vagabond, you won't be an undesirable. All you have to do is work for seven years and you get your land. And if they choose not to do it, they don't want to, what are they going to do? They're just going to do it by forceful means. They're going to go kidnap you. They're going to force you to come over here and work. Now, this kind of indentured labor force, was it freed when America gained its independence and the British uh, lost kind of the right to rule? Or when did this practice end? Uh, they really was. They were not granted their freedom under the United States Constitution because there is a reference in the Constitution to bondsmen of unspecified races, and there were still people profiting from white bondage. Now, when we talk about slavery, of course, to me this is mostly new. When we talk about slavery, we talk about these crowded ships coming over from Africa, with people dying of diseases, people being kept in the holds of these primitive ships. Was it the same for whites? The ships were not designed to carry human cargo. They were designed to carry cargo, period, which could be horses, it could be rum, it could be lumber. Uh, these w ships exhibited a higher rate of fatality for white slaves, as I document in my book, in the Middle Passage, as it's known, than, was, than existed for black slaves. All right, so again, I know, I know a lot of you probably, you know, forgetting people go off on the hijack and these are trigger words you know he's saying white were more in bondage or white servitude was more remember he's just saying white because these are europeans he wrote a whole book he named it white they were white and they were slaves his misunderstanding he's he's assuming i mean he's a scholar this is an old interview i don't know if he thinks like that now but you know this is very old he was still under the impression that all europeans are white he wants to talk about his i guess heritage and he's just wants to show, look, man, we were slaves too. But he has to understand. And I know you guys, a lot of you guys understand it. You don't fall for the hijack and you're ready. And you're ready to dodge the hijack when you hear it. All right, you're ready to dodge it. A lot of these were people of color. I'm not going to, you know, stop saying it. I'm going to repeat it as, as many times as they repeat African, as many times as they repeat white, 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 African, African. I'm going to repeat, no, these are people of color. These are so-called black Europeans, black Europeans. Black Europeans, black Europeans, so-called Negro Europeans, Negro, people of color, black Europeans, Negro, people of color, black Europeans too, right? Put that in your mind. Goes on in this first chapter to explain all the different schemes and all the different types of uh, ventures and what happened when they got here a little bit. Uh, you know, schemes meaning what they did to get people to come over, how they promised them things or how they, you know, but it was a whole, they just wanted basically free labor. And says here, while schemes such as these were carrying their hundreds to the plantations, the regular trade in indentured servants and redemptioners was carrying its tens of thousands. This trade was the backbone of the whole migratory movement. Neither imperialist visions and necessities, nor charitable impulses, nor religious enthusiasms, nor desire for landed possessions kept it going. All right, it wasn't none of those things that kept it going, but simply meaning it wasn't just because people were being persecuted religiously or anything like that, right? That's not the reason it kept going, but simply the fact that colonists wanted white laborers and were willing to pay merchants and ship owners for bringing them, bringing them, all right? They wanted what? White laborers. What does it say anything about Africans here? It's the book, White Servitude in Colonial America, an Economic Analysis. All right, so this is uh, introduction, part one. Wherever slavery ultimately developed, indentured servitude had earlier been in use, all right? To British colonial planters in the early 17th century, the indentured system offered the most accessible supply of bound labor. 
in those colonies in which abundant land and the availability of a profitable staple crop made the demand for labor grow rapidly, there was a high demand for servants. As a result, for many regions, it became true that, as John Corey reported from Virginia in 1619, our principal wealth consistence in servants all the way in 1619, right? That was their wealth. What was their wealth? The labor, the servants were providing these people, free labor. Quantitatively indentured servants played a major role in early British migration to the New World, all right? Although their total numbers are not subject to precise estimation, an indication of their significance is given by Abbott Emerson Smith's judgment that between half and two-thirds of all white immigrants to the American colonies after the 1630s came under indenture or Wesley Frank's Craven's estimate that 75% or more of the Virginia settlers in the 17th century were servants. All right? This is an uncomfortable truth, an untold uh, story, untold history. So we continue in the book, White Servitude in the Colony of Virginia, a study of the system of indentured labor in the American colonies by James Curtin's Bala. All right, 1895, I believe it was written. And we're in, uh, still in chapter two. This is page uh, 38. And it says here, another important source of involuntary servitude was found in the practice of spiriting. All right, now remember, they actually changed the word kidnapping and called it spiriting. <laughs> there was kidnapping people. That's what this meant which grew up in the reign of Charles I and continued throughout the Commonwealth period in the reign of Charles II. It was an organized system of kidnapping persons, an organized system of kidnapping persons, young and old, usually of the laboring classes and transporting them to the plantations to be sold for the benefit of the kidnapper or shipmaster to whom they were assigned. They were kidnapping people from England in the streets, children, old people, anybody. They were kidnapping them, kidnapping, taking them by force, putting them on ships, right? What does this sound like? They told us they were grabbing Africans by force and bringing them over here. But they were actually grabbing undesirable felons and convicts, vagrants, beggars from England and dumping them by force in the plantations of America, all right? It became widely extended in England, but Bristol and London were the centers of the traffic. Throughout London and the parishes of Middlesex County, its agents called spirits were distributed, men and women, yeomen, tradesmen, doctors, and a class of rogues and idlers who earned a livelihood by this means. Even doctors, anybody got into it, women. It was good business, kidnapping people. The ladies of the court and even the mayor of Bristol were not beneath the suspicion of profiting by this lucrative business. Even the mayor was involved. All manners of pre pretenses were used to decoy the victims aboard ships lying in the Thames or the places where they could be assaulted and forcibly conveyed on board to be disposed of to the ship's company or to the merchants. They would trick people into the ships is what they're telling, all kinds of things to get them on. All right. The practice first arose in connection with the West India plantations. Barbados and other island plantations probably received a much greater number than the American colonies. So a lot of these kidnapped people ended up in Barbados and other uh, plantations of the West Indies. Uh, and the mid 18th century is a, a moment when there are the penny press has generating a whole spate of new narratives that are emerging, very often published by people, anyone who could afford a printing press. And which was not insubstantial, but there were a variety of new narratives entering um, the uh, uh, popular libraries. And Peter Williamson, his story is remarkable. He was kidnapped as a young boy, sent into slavery, as he described it, as an indentured servant, a very long apprentice contract, 10 years of an indentured servitude in Pennsylvania, the end of which he was then drafted into the local militia when he fought in the French and Indian War. Um, and was then captured by Delaware Indians and became a, a captive again, a second captive. Uh, and he finally escapes from the Delaware Indian and then returns to Great Britain, uh, where he then publishes his memoir called French and Indian Cruelty. And in it, he um, embraces some of these new ideas that are emerging about white, a white uh, identity that really are more than a language of traffic, but also a language of romance and a language and an ideology of of victimhood 
um, and some of the things that are, we've already discussed that are more familiar. At the heart of his story is the white damsel that he comes upon when he himself is a captive. And he finds her tied to a tree, and the Delaware Indians are about to kill her. And he, along with his other fellow uh, captives, find a way to rescue her. And she, um, uh, and she's actually rescued by a, a British soldier, a British officer. And then there's that kind of redemption of sorts. And it's an imperial, an imperial context, certainly. Um, the other way in which his, uh, I guess I would describe uh, Williamson's uh, whiteness is in, on display, uh, is here in this image in which he sold his book in the garb of a Delaware Indian. And so it wasn't enough just to have a really interesting story that linked different kinds of captivity in colonial America. But in fact, he would go to book fairs, these small little marketplaces around his native town of Aberdeen, and would say French and Indian cruelty, and he, would, he pretended to be a Delaware Indian. And here he is dressed as one. Um, and he's got his tomahawk, his scalping knife, his shot bag, his bag of wampum, his powder horn, his Indian canoe. Well, that's in the image. He didn't carry that with him. And then a war dance. And so he would. How does a so-called supposedly white man who was an indentured servant, how does he go and run away and blend in and hide amongst the Indians? How can he just hide and look like an Indian? Think about it. How does a so-called white person, right? He's supposed to be a white because he's white servant, right? He's supposed to be a white indentured servant, right? How does he go and blend in with Indians, right? Upper colored tribes of America, upper colored tribes of America. You an Indian, right? How does he blend like you? How how can that white man, even if he put on a wig and everything, how would he look like you, right? So just like in scripture, how Joseph, right, he was hiding amongst the Egyptians and they couldn't recognize him, his own brothers. Oh, what did that tell you? That they were the same complexion, right? So how can a white man hide amongst Indians, the copper colored tribes of America? I think about that because he's not so-called white. Remember what white man, traffic person. Form being Indian, um, he would perform his capacity to appropriate Indian culture, playing Indian, uh, he was not the first British subject to do this, this kind of love affair with, uh, uh, with the exotic subject in the empire was not new. What is unique is that he's the first traffic subject himself to do that and to use that as a way of gaining an audience. If you've read the work of David Rodiger, whose work remains foundational to the field uh, and of U.S. labor history, it is blackface minstrelsy. It is the institution in which white workers would become white um, and become white supremacists in the early national period. You have here, in effect, an earlier prototype for that, which is him playing Indian, um, a trafficked servant uh, doing this work. Indeed, the formation of working classes was closely bound up with a mixture of radical anti-slavery sentiment on the one hand and newly embraced white victimhood. That mixture of whiteness and radical anti-slavery did not preclude the formation of working class consciousness, but rather comprised the cultural and intellectual fabric from which it emerged. White slavery, so-called, was at the form formative moment. It was the discourse in which classes emerged in Great Britain and the United States. Uh, that trope did not preclude working class support for black abolitionism, but frequently, in fact, advanced a broader abolition of all slaveries, black as well as white. Um, I am continuing the book, White Servitude in Maryland, 1634 to 1820 by Eugene Irvin McCormick. And it says, chapter five, says, fugitive servants, one of the most noticeable features of indentured servitude and one which greatly impeded the successful operation of the institution was the large number of runaways, all right? All these runaways, runaways, you thought it was just African slaves. No, it was indentured servants, mass, large number of them, from the founding of the colony to the dying out of white servitude. From the very beginning, in the first half of the 19th century, there's abundant evidence that large numbers of servants deserted the service of their masters and their apprehension was one of the most serious problems with which the planters had to deal. These slave catchers, who are they going after really indentured servants? Outside of the convict class, by far the largest number of runaway came from the ranks of the outcast. And ne'er-do-wells from the cities of England and Ireland, all right, these outcasts, 
many of them fleeing from justice or suffering from the pangs of hunger, were attracted by the glowing accounts given by the agents and eagerly accepted this method of reaching the land of gold. They were induced, they were forced, they were kind of like schemed into coming over here and putting themselves in an adventure. It is not all at all likely that these persons had any intention of fulfilling the conditions of the indenture and thought only of the free transportation to America. So a lot of these dudes are like, yeah, but when I get over there, first thing I'm doing I'm, is I'm, I'm, I'm running away. I'm escaping. I ain't working for seven years. These and the convicts became the professional runaways. All right. The convicts and all these uh, outcasts, these were the runaways. Not no African slaves. You understand what we're reading here? Like this is in Maryland, but this happened in the ma mass scale all over all these states where they had indentured servants. These same type of indentured servants to convicts and these outcasted people from Europe. From the publication of the first newspaper in Maryland to long after the revolution, it is difficult to find a number whose columns do not contain from one to 10 advertisements for runaway servants, all right? We've seen a lot of examples of that already, right? All these newspapers during those times filled with runaway ads of servants. The Rise and Fall of Indentured Servitude in the Americas, an Economic Analysis by David D. Gelson. So here, the evolution of indentured servitude in colonial uh, British America. Indentured uh, servitude was an initial solution to an acute problem of obtaining a labor supply that existed in many regions of colonial America. And the basic form of institution developed by the Virginia Company was widely adopted and used throughout the British colonies in the 17th and 18th centuries. Although precise estimates of the total numbers of servants are not available, all right? They're not gonna, so when they tell these estimates, like I always say, like they always say in two thirds or about this percentage, that's them being modest. I'm telling you, it's guessing, but they know it's high. So they even tell you high two thirds or 80, 75% is high. An indication of the overall quantitative importance is given by Abbott Emerson Smith. Judgment noted earlier that between half and two thirds of all white immigrants to the American colonies after the 1630s came under indenture. Their importance at times in particular regions was even greater. As is suggested by Wesley Frank Craven's estimate that 75% or more of Virginia settlers in the 17th century were servants 75 percent were servants indentured chattel property I'm talking about european settling virginia all right not africans although initially all the servants came from england in the course of the colonial period migrants from other countries joined the flow of servants to british america and especially in the 18th century sizable numbers of scottish irish and german immigrants arrived in the colonies under indenture active markets for indenture servants arose in europe and in the colonies hundreds of english merchants in the major british ports participated in binding emigrants for servitude overseas transportation costs varied little across individuals or destinations and differences in the emigrants productivity which affected the rate at which they could repay the implicit loans were therefore reflected in variation in the lens of the terms to which they were bound. Surviving collections of indentures clearly show that characteristics that raised the expected productivity of a servant tended to shorten the term for which the servant was indentured. Thus, the length of the indenture varied inversely with age, skill, and literacy, while servants bound for the West Indies received shorter terms and compensation for their undesirable destinations the presence of these markets provided a consistent link between European labor supply and the labor demand of colonial planters from the 1620s through the time of the American Revolution. Again, all the way up to 1776, indentured servants. So where's the Africans? When did the uh, slavery, they started outlawing it? Like almost 1807, they're declaring it, right? The Act of 1807. So all the way to 1776 indentured servants. The efficiency of the institution within the colonies was further increased by the fact that indentures were generally transferable and masters could therefore freely buy and sell the remaining terms of servants already present in America in response to the changes in econo economic circumstances. Um, Continuing the book, White Servitude in the Colony of Virginia, a study of system of indentured labor in the American colonies. It says here in chapter two still, uh, page 40 says the servants in Virginia were usually English, Scotch, or Irish, but there were also a few Dutch, French, Portuguese, and Polish. They were usually transported persons, but residents in the colony also sold themselves into servitude for various reasons. All right, colonists sold themselves into servitude? Well, why didn't they just go get Africans if it was so easy? 
the demand for servants before the rights of slavery was always very great in the American colonies and was further enhanced by that of the island plantations. It was the impossibility of supplying this by the regular means that furnished the justification professed in the English penal statutes and gave encouragement to the illicit practice of spiriting, kidnapping. In the early years before these means were resorted to, dealing in servants had become a very profitable business. The London merchants were not slow to see the advantage of such a trade. A servant might be transported at a cost of from six to eight pounds and sold for 40 pounds or 60 pounds. And a systematic speculation in servants was begun both in England and in Virginia. Regular agencies were established and servants might be had, might be had by anyone who wished to import them at a day's warning. Others were consigned to merchants in Virginia or sent with shiploads of goods on a venture. The demand continued unabated until near the last quarter of the 17th century. The numbers were so considerable in 1651 that the commissioner of the Commonwealth who were sent to demand the submission of Virginia were authorized in case of resistance to levy the servants for reducing the colony. From this time to the beginning of the decline of the system, the yearly importations were very large. The number imported from 16 64 to 671, averaging 1,500 a year. So one of the things I also discovered in the research is that white slavery is a really, the political content of whiteness was mm -hmm. remarkably divided. And yep. that there was a kind of fight over its political meaning. Hmm. That is important for recognizing uh, a kind of fault line in contemporary white supremacy. Uh, this was not simply... Uh, an assertion or a, a naturalized understanding that all white people share something. It was, uh, had a particular political target in mind, uh, the way it was being used by traffic subjects. Um, so um, that said, the ways in which whiteness became legitimated as a broader cross-class identity uh, at this moment in time, a political project that was uncertain, fighting abolitionism, mm -hmm. I mean, as well as supporting it, mm -hmm. uh, critiquing uh, imperial policy, uh, as well as supporting other ones. White servitude and convict labor in America, 1607-1776. We are still in chapter 2, page 35. And it says here, the profits of the trade. Never during the colonial period did it cost more than five or six pounds sterling to transport a servant to the plantations. The Virginia Company paid six pounds in 1619. And in 1750, the Board of Trade contracted with merchants to take settlers to Nova Scotia at five pounds five shillings each. The Georgia Trust usually paid five pounds for the passage of their free colonies, but shipped at least one lot of indentured servants for only four pounds apiece. In 1708, a merchant tried to get seven uh, pounds each from the government for taking palatines to New York and was told that his bid was too high. So they were bringing what? They were trying to bring what? Palatines to New York. What is a palatine? German palatines, says here in Wikipedia. The German Palatines were early 18th century emigrants from the Middle Rhine region of the Holy Roman Empire, including a minority from the Palatine, which gave its name to the entire group. They were both Protestant and Catholic. Towards the end of the 17th century and into the 18th, the wealthy region was repeatedly invaded by French troops, which resulted in continuous military requisitions, widespread devastation and famine. The poor Palatines were some 13,000 Germans who migrated to England between May and November 1709. Their arrival in England and the inability of the British government to integrate them caused a highly polit politicized debate over the merits of immigration. The English tried to settle them in England, Ireland, and what? The colonies, the American colony. The English transported nearly 3,000 German Palatines in 10 ships. 10 ships, 3,000 people. We're not talking about 10... Slave ships from Africa here, man. I, I need you guys to really understand what, we, what we're reading here. You know, we've been reading so many. I mean, are the numbers starting to add up? Just think about it. Look how this, will, right? you know, how this will multiply. These, these, these indentured servants, these Europeans. We're talking about 10 ships that didn't come from Africa. We got talking about 10 ships full of German palatines. All right, so in 1708... They were trying to sell these same Palatine Germans for seven pounds. And they were like, nah, man, you're charging too much for these Germans. Bring the price down. All right, all right. So bring the price down for these Germans, man. They ain't that expensive, man. They're cheaper than that. All right. So again, going to go back, right? Repetitive, right? Germans, right? What did Benjamin Franklin say about the Palatine Germans? Specifically, the Palatine Boers. 
Instead of calling them Moors, you call them Boers. And again, Germans, these Palatines are swarthy complexions, swarthy, swarthy, swarthy. I know it's hard when you're reading these things, like Germans, uh, uh, Palatines, you're totally disconnected from it because you're assuming these are not related to you in any, in any way. I actually did somebody's genealogy a lot, actually two or three ge genealogies that went back to these Palatines coming out of Pennsylvania, Maryland, all these places, right? These were people of color. And so again, don't forget these German Palatines, he was saying they were straight up swarthy. They were swarthy. It says in 1638, a shipload of servants sent to Virginia was sold off at various amounts ranging from 250 to 600 pounds of tobacco per servant. Shipload of what? Servants, not Africans. Shipload. It is difficult to be sure how much this represented in money, but at rate of six pence a pound, this means that they brought from about six to nearly 15 pounds apiece. The same year, servants were sold in Barbados for 500 pounds of tobacco each, which may be about 12 pounds sterling. The average price in Maryland during the earlier 17th century has been estimated as from 15 to 20 pounds in Virginia, as high as 40 to 60 pounds. Sir Thomas Modiford said in 1670 that male servants sold in Jamaica, where? In Jamaica, we're talking about Europeans, in Jamaica, selling, people being sold, slavery, sold, for 12 pounds to 15 pounds and females from 10 to 12 pounds. We have already seen that the island's fixed prices by law ranging as high as 18 pounds apiece for good servants. And this figure was intended to attract trade. In Jamaica, a good tradesman was said to bring about 40 pounds in 1739. All right. In Jamaica, we still got indentured servants in 1739. And other less skillful servants went for 20 pounds each. And also you know, levelers and fugitive uh, runaway advertisements and the contrast in political economies of mid 18th century, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania by Barry Levi, University of Massachusetts Amherst. Continuing, many old white servants had families that had been developed and grown in servitude, all right? Many white servants had families that had been what? Grown all their lives in what? Servitude, in this one regard, they were similar to black, so-called black people, Indian and other colored slaves. So no different than the so-called Negro, right? No different. Of course, some old white runaway families cross racial lines. In short, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware clearly had a large group of permanently servile whites, all right? Permanently servile whites, permanent. People who lived their lives in servitude and who developed families likely to stay in servitude. I'm talking about white people here. And you know why they're saying white? Because these are all European indentured servants. So they got to say white. But we don't know if they're all white. Many white children in Pennsylvania grew up in servile families. When Thomas Johnson, age 30, ran from Thomas Oogle of Newcastle County, Delaware, in 1751, he took his wife, a little boy, about four or five years of age, with him. Similarly, when an Irish servant, Charles Campbell, ran from Henry Huddleston, Plumstead Township, Bucks County in 1739, he was supposed to be in company with one Martha Bostock, a short, well-said woman with red hair and poke broken, has a child with her about five years old. In 1741, Benjamin Mifflin of Philadelphia noted that his servant, Henry Carpenter, is a great boaster and has a son with him of his own name. This son was 13 years old. Like the stories of the slaves of the Old South, all right, just like the stories of the slaves of the Old South, many white Pennsylvania servants ran to reunite their families. Such servants were not just German redemptioners seeking to reunite families soon after arriving. In 1746, Rachel Pickering, a 30-year-old English woman, fled from Matthias Curlin, tavern keeper in Concord, Chester County, Pennsylvania. Curling noted that she had a Batman child with her about six months old. Curling had information that she was carried up from Newcastle County to Philadelphia in a boat and that she had been here heard to inquire of one Timothy Connor, who she says is her husband, but he is only her bastard's supposed father. He served his time with one William Peters, Fuller living near Concord, the Delaware Valley free labor market, apparently 
disappointed and defeated many white ex-servants who returned to servitude after gaining freedom from the original labor contract and then decided to run later in life. Historians are beginning to uncover a class of lifelong servile white workers, lifelong servile white workers and cottagers in the middle colonies. And these advertisements confirm these findings. All right, these advertisements, these are recorded history. It confirms these findings and this unusual and depressing feature of the middle colony, middle co colonies labor system. Between 1720 and 1760, over 35% of the runaway Delaware white men and women whose ages were specified were older than 24. Some of these uh, were men who arrived at older ages to begin their American adventures. But as the adver advertisements make clear, most had served several terms of indenture in the middle colonies or in Maryland. They had failed to cultivate the discipline or skills of poor Richard to compete well in an unregulated labor market. Some fell into debt or had to sell themselves into servitude contracts again to eat. All right, continuing this book and right here, it talks about, uh, you know, how the runaways would do different things to uh, escape and change their clothing and everything. So they would brand them, right? So it says here in retaliation, Pennsylvania masters use tattoos to keep servants from simply shedding their clothes and thereby their historical identities. In all the New England and advertisements, not a single white runaway sported a tattoo. However, some 50 Pennsylvania white runaways had tattoos or brands imprinted on their bodies by their masters or merchant suppliers in order to deter escapes and aid in recaptures. Many servants, particularly from Quaker districts, had the initials of their names tattooed with gunpowder on their hands, usually the left hand near the thumb. Gunpowder tattoos were created by etching or cutting the skin with a needle and plugging the wounded skin with gunpowder. The burning procedure was not intensely painful, or so it is said. For example, Joseph Brennan of Crosswick, New Jersey, reported that his runaway servant, John Henry, had J.H. picked with gunpowder on one of his hands. So oh, that's what they mean, that they were branded. Masters tattooed women as well. Abraham Shelley of Philadelphia reported that his Irish runaway, his Irish runaway, Eleanor Kavanaugh, alias Plunkett, age 35, had EP and blue road and gunpowder on the back of her left hand. She is a good spinner. All right, so that was the code. The gunpowder was basically the tattoo of the brand they were putting on them. But uh, there was finally a law passed. Uh, if you look at Henning's uh, history of the statutes of Virginia, they actually had to pass a law saying, that no black or Indian shall hold a Christian in bondage. Well, Christian was a euphemism for white person. So that's one of the pieces of evidence that we know. Because, you know, they came to be very ashamed and embarrassed. Uh, the record of white enslavement is not something that they wanted to broadcast to the world. It was something that existed in a kind of an anomalous and ambiguous fashion, and one has to hunt these things out. Now, I'm not saying that it's uh, something that was in code. But if we see a law that says no Indian or black shall hold Christians in bondage, we have to understand that these were people who were very reluctant to pass a great deal of laws. The people at that time felt, those who were religiously inclined, felt that the Ten Commandments were plenty of laws. If they passed a law, you can be sure that it was because there was a need for it. Mm -hmm. And certain fortunate whites, as well as fortunate blacks, because there were also free blacks who owned whites, free blacks who owned blacks and blacks who were involved in an indentured system that was very humane and legitimate that I'm outlining here. Now, how about this thing that there were free blacks that had white slaves? Oh, yes. Uh, the early 17th century experience in America was one of, you would say, uh, Reagan capitalism really prevailed in the 17th century in America. It was pretty much a capitalist domain and it was an unregulated domain. And the idea that there was an ideology of white uh, supremacy, which always protected poor white people and always gave them a higher station or status than blacks, is a, a, a tissue of falsehood. Because if you study the status of white slaves in Great Britain prior to the colonization and peopling of North America, you find that they were synonymous with a type of subhuman. That was the ideology of the ruling class in Great Britain. 
Now, that ideology didn't suddenly stop as soon as they confronted the experience of colonization in America. It was carried over. So there was a sense among the British aristocracy, uh, who were now the governors of the crown colonies in British America, that if blacks were holding some individual whites in slavery or bondage, well, what the heck? These were, after all, poor whites, and this was their natural state. Uh, to the credit, I certainly don't wish to indict all wealthy whites. I'm not engaged in the class warfare here. Uh, my own, I come from a family that had a, a fairly affluent background, so I, I don't have any axe to grind. It's just that this is what the facts, the documentary record, the empirical facts speak, and I must therefore be the vessel of their articulation. So this is a future video I'm going to do about the black populations of England. This is one of them. One of the major cities that had a, a black, so-called black population was Bristol, along with Liverpool. You know, in history, they'll tell you the same hijack. All oh, these were Africans and since the African slave trade, but there was actually so-called black people there before slave trade started, before, you know, colonial times, all right? Uh, there was a major so-called black population in Bristol. Now, let me show you something real quick. I bought a book, great book. I had to get it. As soon as I found it, I had to get it. It was not available anywhere in the internet or, you know, like you couldn't read it. You had to buy it. I had to buy it. All right. What's the name of this book? It's called The Bristol Registers. It says Servants Sent to Foreign Plantations, 1654 to 1686 by Peter Wilson Coldhand. The Bristol Registers. All right. The Bristol Registers. They got permission from the Bristol Historical Society. This is a very scholarly uh, register they copied. I just want to read. So remember. All right, what they're going to talk about here, what are they saying? About people they're sending from Bristol, England. It says here, on 29th of September, 1654, the Council of the City of Bristol enacted an ordinance requiring that a system of enrollment be set up to record the names of all indentured servants embarking from the port of Bristol for service overseas. On the very next day, the first entry was penned in what was to become the register known as Servants to Foreign Plantations. The need for scrupulous arose from the long-standing and notorious practice by of kidnapping, all right, kidnapping, inveigling, and bribing junctures onto ships bound for the labor-hungry uh, colonies, there to be sold at good profit, sold like cattle. Nor was the practice without weighty precedent. For as early as 1619, the state had connived at the rounding up of vagrant children in London in their forcible shipment to Virginia, to Virginia. But when private enterprise adopted similar measures, the state took exception and prosecuted those responsible. Nevertheless, forcible shipments of servants, indentured or not, continued apace. An order of parliament of 9th May, 1645, required of officers and justices to exercise diligence in apprehending those responsible for the kidnapping and shipping of children and the city fathers of Bristol may perhaps be considered negligent and having allowed nine years to pass before regulating these matters. So they let nine years go by, people were just getting kidnapped, sent, they were doing whatever they want. They grabbed whoever, whoever they wanted. This decline from the previously high standard set by Bristol has an interesting sequel, Judge Jeffrey's bloody assizes took him in 1685 to Bristol where he condemned many hundreds involved in Momo's rebellion to be transported from that port to Barbados, all right, Jacobites. On the same occasion, he took the opportunity of castigating local merchants and magistrates, merchants, Sephardi Jews and Moors for their evil practices. A contemporary wrote, there have been a usage among the aldermen and justices of the city were all persons, even common shopkeepers, more or less trade to the American plantations to carry over criminals and to sell them for money. It's all about money, right? This was found to be a good trade, but not being content to take such felons as were convicts as their assizes and sessions, which produced but a few, they found out a shorter way which yielded a greater plenty of the commodity. What small rogues and pilferers were taken and brought before the court were put under terror by being hanged and some of the diligent officers attended and instructed them to pray transportation as the only way to save them. And for the most part, they did so. So it was either get hung, die, or go work in a plantation. What would you choose? 
Then no more was done, but the next elder men in course took one and another as their turns came, sometimes quarreling who's the last was, and sent them over to America and sold them. Jeffrey formed the opinion that all the justices and aldermen, including the mayor of Bristol, were tamed by this practice. Again, we read this earlier. Even the mayor of Bristol, everybody in Bristol was making money off this, selling people to the merchants, getting rid of the undesirables, trafficking people. When he discovered that a boy from one of the city's prisons had been illegally transported, he summoned Sir William Heyman, the then mayor, to the bar, accused him of complicity in the crime, fined him a thousand pounds, and bound him and three others over to appear before the king's bench on further charges of kidnapping the king's subjects or servitude overseas. But runs the account, the prosecution depended until the revolution of 1688, which made an amnesty and the right only, which was no small one, was all the punishment these juridical kidnappers underwent and the gains acquired by so wicked a trade rested peacefully in their pockets, all right, in their back pockets. A total of just over 10,000 immigrants recorded in this book, all but a small handful were laborers, right? 10,000 people right here. And I guarantee, I don't know if anybody listening right now, but I know I guarantee somebody eventually listening to this this is some of their ancestors out of those 10,000 immigrants recorded in this book. All but a small handful were laborers, husbandmen, and tradesmen, most from the West Country, the West Midlands, and Wales, but with fair sprinkling of intended immigrants from much further afield, including London, Cambridge, Lancashire, Scotland, Ireland, France, and even from the American colonies themselves, even from American colonies. Wait, hold up. Hold up. Did you guys just understand what they just said right there? There was already Americans over there that you were transporting back to America? Oh, let's not forget, right, who the Spanish and Portuguese and the English were first enslaving when they got here and what they were doing with them, right? They were sending them over to Europe and Africa. They were sending them over to Europe and Africa. So now they got them back. Now they're bringing them back. Like, oh, man, let's just bring them back. We make more money. Let's make money double off them. So even American colonies themselves, even from the American colonies, they were there already in Bristol being sent back. So who's these Americans if they're not Europeans? Indians, right? Indians. While many undoubtedly arrived in Bristol having already indentured themselves to overseas service, there is good reason to suppose that a great number came there speculatively in order to seek a considerate master to sign them up on the spot. Some people would just really wanted to come. They volunteered. You got to understand, you get a freedom, dude. You might get 50 acres after you do your seven years or even more. It depends on what contract you do, what bound, how you bound yourself. If you're one of those lucky that get to choose, that get to volunteer, all right? We get some idea of what terms of good indenture provided from certain of the earliest entries in the registers. A five or seven year agreement would typically promise the servant at the end of his or her service a house and axe, a year's provision and double apparel, and sometimes a few acres of land. Sometimes what? A few acres of land. This, of course, was in addition to the provisions of free passage. But it should not be assumed that all servants received such a generous treatment, nor indeed that all went voluntarily on shipboard. All right, let's not forget a lot of these people were being forced as convicts, as prisoners of war, poor undesirables rebels, anything, and they will force them. They will pack them like sardines in these chips. We're going to read this, all right? So they didn't all get a good treatment. From surviving notes, it is clear that errant children could be packed off to the colonies by their parents or guardians, and there is further evidence. See the entry from July 20, 1659, that passengers could be forcibly detained on board ship. The story of how racers were discovered after 200 years is in dusty obscurity is one beloved of archivists, all right? It was what, 200 years? It was just like this, sitting in dust. Uh, let's not, re re let's just create a, an African slave trade story for about 200, 300, 400 years. And then, you know, when that passes over, then we can, uh, you know, publish these things, right? These books, these transcripts, these registers, so they can see who they were really sending to the Caribbean and the plantations. All right, we're going to show a little examples, all right? When in 1925, the Corporation of Bristol decided to rebuild the ancient council house, 
The storerooms on the top floor were cleared of a mass of old records, and behind an ancient wall press were found the two volumes called Servants to Foreign Plantations. Wait a minute. You're making it seem like these things were really well hidden. They built a wall? There was a wall hiding this? Are you serious? These provide a unique record of indentured emigrants who shipped from Bristol, then the premier English port for emigration, all right? Bristol was a major hub, major hub. Talk about slave port. You want to talk about slave port? You want to talk about a door of no return? A real one? A real door of no return? Not the fake one that they just proved it was a mansion over there in Senegal. It wasn't even a slave port. It was somebody's mansion. There was no real history of any slave ever being there. That's how deep they lied to you and you believed it. That's how deep you never researched it. That's how deep this goes, all right? Because the real place, a real, if you want to call slave, so-called slave, then this is one of them, Bristol, England. Within four years of their discovery, R. Hargreaves Madsley published a severely summarized transcription of the title of Bristol in America. And that slim volume has well served a whole generation of historians and genealogists. Nevertheless, researchers have long known that the book, despite four reprints, contained a large number of faulty transcriptions, omits much material essential to a proper comprehension of the subject, and lacks adequate indexes. It is those reasons which have dictated the preparation of the present volume. So he, they try to fix that. All right. So Peter Wilson, appreciate what you did here. Let me just show you an example now. I want to just show you what's in here. The whole book is full of this. It's a really big book. I only took uh, pictures with my phone of a couple pages, just so I can show you guys. All right, so it says here, Richard Pell to Robert Reed of Bristol. He was a copper guy, right? He wasn't just a slave. He knew how to mill copper and stuff. He worked for three years under him in Barbados. He was bound to a plantation in Barbados. Thomas, who Thomas Reed, he was in Virginia. He was there for six years doing his indenture, doing his time. All right, George Palmer, all right? So again, I just wanted you guys to see where they were going. Four years to Virginia. All right, four years of Virginia, Barbados, Virginia, 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 five years in Virginia, you see, all right? This guy went to uh, Barbados, five years in Barbados, Barbados. This Irish guy, he went to Barbados. All right, this Scottish guy, he went to Barbados, Barbados, all right? A lot of Barbados. They went everywhere. I'm just showing you examples. They went all over the East Coast. So Nevis, right? Nevis, that's in the Caribbean as well, in Virginia right here. Barbados, 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 Barbados. So who was really in Barbados coming up from Barbados? Who were they sending to Barbados uh, from New England? You guys remember that? The pets and all these Indians, they didn't like all the double Indians and all these, that they, they were sending them to Barbados too, under indenture. Not just Europeans. That's what I'm saying. So where's all these, why would they need to go get Africans if they got all these indentured servants and they got Indians? All this free labor they got, why would they go all the way and risk themselves to go a lot further? You know, that's not a, that's not a good business uh, uh, plan. It's not a good business plan. These are real. These are real. Some of these might end up being your ancestors. A lot of these are people of color. A lot of these ain't slave names. Those are your actual names. You get it? It's not slave names. If anything, they might have taken your name. You never know. The whole book is full of this. This one's 1662, so it goes by year, and it tells you what day they got there. All right. Virginia, Virginia, a lot sent this time during this period to Virginia, right? They were trying to colonize Virginia, right? An example, so you can see John Webb to Richard Thorne, five years in Jamaica, all right? Four years in Jamaica, Hannah Legg, William Harris, five years in Jamaica, Thomas Whittle, he went to New England. This guy went to New England. All right, Margaret Howell, Jamaica, Edward Knight, Jamaica, 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 Newfoundland, Jamaica, Newfoundland, Jamaica, Newfoundland. You guys are starting to overstand? You wanted to see slave ships? <laughs> what slave ships? Charles Jones, Maryland, Virginia, 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 Jamaica, Maryland, 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 Virginia, Virginia. Who's going to the plantations? Who's growing tobacco? Who's going to work the, the sugar plantations? 
these sugar plantations were owned by who? Sephardic Jews. Who started the sugar plantations? Who started that whole sugar plantation system? It was the Sephardic Moors, first in North Africa, then in the Canary Islands, St. Thomas, uh, off the coast of Guinea, Cape Verde, the Azores, Madeiras, and then they brought that to the Caribbean and the East Coast. Sugar plantation in the South. All right, again, more people, Margaret Seward, the Nevis, Barbados, Nevis, Jamaica, Philip Davy to Jamaica, Edward Lydia to Jamaica, Nevis, Jamaica, Jamaica, Barbados, Montserrat. How they celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Oh, y'all remember that. Yeah, you, any of you ever been to St. Patrick's Day in Montserrat? It's the biggest in the world. Even the Irish like to go there, say it's better than the one in their country. <laughs> Jamaica, Barbados, Nevis, Jamaica, Montserrat, Edward Jones, Jamaica, Nevis, Virginia, Virginia, Nevis, you see? The year 1669, goes by years, William Dyer to Nevis, Elizabeth Price to Jamaica, Williams, Perrin, Lewis, Benoni, Watkins, all these people, Jamaica, Barbados, Barbados, Nevis, Nevis, Jamaica. All right, you guys get it, right? The cool thing about the book, it actually uh, shows the ship names. There's a whole index of the ship names. There's an index of the people. So you can look if you had a, uh, if you you think you have an ancestor, you go and look for the index and you look for the name and tell you what page is on, where he might have gone. And, you know, things like that, the master's name and where the origin, where the countries were of the origin. So it's very diverse. All right. All right. And it has an article here. I just wanted to read from the very interesting. It says Irish indentured servants in the colonies. It says our 18th century newspaper collection includes the Pennsylvania Gazette and the South Carolina Gazette. Both newspapers carried many advertisements for the sale of indentured contracts and the recovery of runaway servants. All right, not just slave servants, indentured contract. It says August 16, 1750, a runaway on the 12th instant from Joseph Jackson of London Grove Chester County, an Irish servant man named William Farrell of middle stature and brown complexion, brown complexion, who? An Irish servant. We're talking about an Irish servant. He's not white. He's not pale. He's brown complexion. Aren't you brown complexion? So is this a white person or a so-called Negro? Anything would be up to conjecture, but we have a description of him clearly stating and describing him as brown complexion, all right? Head on when he went away, stripped final jacket, a brown sailor's jacket, a pair of coarse trousers, stripped drawers, a felt hat and check, checkered shirt, his hair cut off. Likewise, all right, so it's going to say that he also ran away with somebody else. So it says, likewise, ran away with the aforesaid servant, an Irish servant, another Irish servant named Thomas Collard, all right? Belonging to Samuel Ramsey of Londonbury, Samuel Ramsey, so that was his servant, in the said county of a dark complexion, of a dark complexion. So this Irish servant man, this other runaway, this other runaway, Thomas Collard, is of dark complexion. So his boy, Joseph, uh, let me see, what's his name? Willem Farrell. Irish people of color, indigenous people from Ireland over here. They were sending them over here. Run away from the subscribers. The 15th of September, two Irish indented servants, one named Maurice Crony, about five feet, eight inches high, a fair complexion with his own hair, wore a white shirt, a sailor's blue jacket, Osnaburg trousers and shoes without stockings. His ankles are very much swelled. The other named Jeremiah Harrington, about five feet, five inches high, has fair hair, had on a brownish colored coat, Osnaburg jacket and trousers, white worked stockings and shoes. The conversation will convince any person that they are natives of Ireland. A reward of 20 besides all reasonable expense is offered for each to any person who will apprehend and bring them to Savannah. Joshua Vaughn Peter Bliss. 
Uh, it's called the Swedish Settlements on the Delaware. Uh, their history in relation to the Indians, Dutch, and English from 1638 to 1664. With an account of the South, the New Sweden, and the American companies and the efforts of Sweden to regain the colony, Volume 2. Uh, it's two volumes of this. And again, I didn't see nothing about no slaves or African slaves or anything like that. I did find uh, this uh, reference here on, on, on this page, 548 in Volume 2. And it says, slavery was not employed to any extent by the settlers. The slave brought to Christina in 1639 was employed for many years. But beyond this single case, there's no record of slaves in New Sweden. New Sweden is Delaware and New Holland area. There's no slaves there because it was indentured servants. All these people, a lot of these Swedish people that came were indentured servants. And they, a lot of them, again, the owners were given land grants as well. They did the same thing. And they started the indentured servitude. And I want to go to the footnote. All right, because it says footnote 59, right? So who's this slave? The slave brought to Katrina. That's the only record of a slave. Other than that, there's no records. Now, in the footnote, it says that this so-called slave was actually Lars Swartz. Remember, he was being employed. He got, he was employed for many years. Employed meaning he was in a contract. He was paid probably. Lars Swartz, all right? Swartz, what does Swartz mean? Swartz, we already know Swarty. Swartz, that's black. Might have been a Negro slave. As he says, might have been, right? They don't know. Might have been a Negro slave. They don't know. But it is more likely that Swartz simply referred to his complexion. All right? So Lars Swartz might have been a Negro slave, but it is more likely that Swartz simply referred to his complexion. He's not a slave. He's an indentured servant. All right. So I want to get into uh, this book. Very good book I found here. I'm glad I found this. Uh, it's called Bound Over indentured servitude and american conscious by john van dersey forward by john patrick diggins this is from 1985 and i just want to show real quick this is in the back of the book the sources very scholarly book primary sources all right you can see it's a very long list and this is in the introduction of the book and it says here what exactly was on the minds of the english irish scottish german and other immigrants when they said, let's get out, let's go to America. Thanks to John Van Dersey, Bound Over, his book that we're reading right now, we know now the reasons that prompted many Europeans to come to America and the conditions in which they arrived. Some were between one half and two thirds of all the colonists came to the new world as what? Voluntary what? Slaves, indentured servants. Well, they'll say that voluntary, but we know we know, right, to touch the hijack, we know a lot of them were being kidnapped or convicted felons and all that, undesirables that were being sent over. It says indentured servants, apprentices, tenants, bond servants, and the like, all agreeing to the status of redemptionary in one form or another. A person who, lacking the means, accepts free transportation as the price of four to seven years of unrelenting servitude to an unknown master. As Van der See makes clear, Memories of servitude weighed heavily on the minds of leaders like Tom Paine, Benjamin Franklin, Joseph Galloway, and Alexander Hamilton. All right, big one right there, right? So, right, I did a video, right, on Benjamin Franklin. He was an indentured servant. He was a servant to his dad, supposedly. And he, he ran away. He was a runaway slave, basically. He was a runaway slave. That's why he ran away, because he was treated like property. Benjamin Franklin. Now, they're letting us know here, Alexander Hamilton... Joseph Galloway and Tom Paine as well. These people all, were all indentured servants. But it remains to be considered whether those who had once felt the tyranny of servitude would emerge as classical Republicans dedicated to civic duty or economic liberals aspiring to individual opportunity. It says, in any event, Van der See shows how the experience of indentured servitude made many Americans not only suspicious of British rule, but keenly aware of man's tendency to exploit fellow men, an attitude deeply felt in the debates over the Constitution and continuing into the Civil War itself. What Lincoln learned from the Bible, his successor, remember Lincoln, the so-called Negro, Lincoln, President Andrew Johnson, an ex-indentured servant, all oh, Andrew Johnson and what an ex-indentured servant learned from personal experience. I want to read on from this book now, it's called The Peopling of British North America, an introduction by Bernard 
Bailey. All right, he has a lot of good uh, sources for his information. We're going to get into this book now. It says here, as I suggested earlier, the original recruitment of the 17th century population was largely, though not wholly, the product of efforts to divert to the colonies a portion of the mobile English labor force. Reliable estimates of the numbers involved have now been established 378,000 emigrants from England to the Western Hemisphere in the course of the 17th century, of whom 155 went to the mainland colonies. The majority of them, what? Indentured servants. They wasn't here just because they wanted a free ride over here and start a new life. They didn't pay their own way over here. These were indentured servants slash slaves. And we know something of their geographical origin. Almost all of the indentured servants came from Southern England with a high concentration in the Danes Valley centered in London. Their social origins are less clear, but there are fairly clear boundaries. These 17th century labor migrants form a spectrum from the utterly destitute, the disreputable and the vagrant to the respectable young artisans or would be artisans seeking more secure employment and eventually an independent stake in the land. All right, so they try to sugarcoat it but he, they told you a little bit they were they're undesirable they're destitute they're disreputable and vagrant that's what they were sending over here in these later years of the colonial period their numbers were supplemented by convicts from all over britain about fifty thousand of them were transported to america to serve out their time and unpaid labor along with the free indentured servants there were irish and scotch too among the 18th century labor recruits and above all a mass of German redemptioners whose presence like that of the Irish was a major fact of social life everywhere in North America, from Lunenburg in Nova Scotia to the southern borderlands of Georgia and Florida. All, right, all these countries sending their uh, undersibles, all these indentured servants from different parts uh, of Europe. Oh, we got a, a runaway ad. Ran away from Captain McCarty's plantation on Pope's Creek in Westmoreland County, a servant man belonging to the subscriber in Prince William County. His Christian name is John, but surname for God is Pretty Tall, a bricklayer by trade. And as a Kentish man, Kentish, he came hmm. into Potomac in the forward captain major last year. All right. He came into Potomac. It's supposed to have the figure of Savior marked with gunpowder on one of his arms. He went, they were doing that to the indentured servants. They were marking them up with gunpowder. He went away about 20th of April last in company with three other servants. Richard Martin is a middle-sized man, fresh colored, about 22 years of age. And as a sailor, had on a blue jacket, Richard Cable is middle-sized, young fellow, has several marks made of gunpowder on his arms, particularly on his breast, being the figures of a woman in cherry tree, and is a carpenter by trade. He wore blue gray coat with a large cape, a snuff-colored waistcoat and buckskin breeches. Edward Ormsby is a small thin fellow, of a swarthy complexion, swarthy complexion, and is a tailor by trade, has a hesitation of stammering in his speech, and being an Irishman, all right, he's an Irishman, I know people are like, well, how do you know he's, he's a European, well, he's an Irishman, in his swarthy complexion, had a good deal of brogue, they went away from Captain Isla's landing on Potomac in a small boat, and are supposed to be gone towards the eastern shore of North Carolina. Whoever will secure the said brick layers so that he may be again shall have five pounds reward beside what the law allows. All right. So they're like, please bring back my Irish man. My Irish man. Please bring back my Irish swarthy man. Now it says Virginia Gazette Parks, Williamsburg from August 10th to August 17th, 1739. 1739. Right. Says ran away the 8th of July last from the subscribers living in Westmoreland County, four servant men with John McHugh, Francis Mann, Daniel Fitzpatrick, and John Freelove. John McHugh is an Irish man of middle stature. He's swarthy complexion. He's an Irish man. John McHugh, Mac, Mac, remember the Mac, Mac, John McHugh is an Irish man. He has on one of his arms a bleeding heart pricked in gunpowder and name length. Several other letters. All right. So, okay, then we get uh, Francis Mann. Francis Mann is an Englishman. All right, so now we got an Englishman, right? Not a, just an Irishman. We got an English, a Briton, right? An Englishman, a middle stature, and he's also swarthy complexion, short brown hair, and yellowish rotten teeth, 
man, speaks quick. And <laughs> but we know, you know what they were saying about the Europeans, a lot of them that were coming here. There's a lot of the undesirables, a lot of the drunks, a lot of the peasants on the street. You know, the on the bed. It was like, yo, let's just send them over there. Let's just come on, hurry up, man. Let's get that Swarthy peasant out of here. You know, that's what they were doing by massive numbers. This is from the Oxford Journal, says here, Oxford University Press. That's from JSTOR. It says British convicts shipped to American colonies. All right. Author James Davy Butler, The American Historical Review, Volume 2, Number 1, October 1896, pages 12 to 33. The Oxford University Press of American Historical Association. And it says here, British convicts shipped to American colonies. It says convicts were sent to nine of the American settlements. Convicts. According to one estimate, about 2,000 had been sent for many years annually. Dr. Land, after comparing various estimates, concludes that the number sent might be about 50,000 altogether. Again, in the Encyclopedia Britannica, under the article Botany Bay, we read, on the revolt of the New England colonies, the convict establishment in America were no longer available. And so the attention of the British government was turned to Bot Botany Bay. And in 1787, a penal settlement was formed there. It seems certain that among the felons sent to New England, by far the largest element was made up of prisoners taken in battle. A letter from Reverend John Cotton to Cromwell, dated Boston, July 28, 1651, states that sundry Scots taken by him at Dunbar September 2nd, 1650, had arrived there and been sold not for slaves to perpetual servitude, perpetual servitude, but for six or seven or eight years. That's the word, sundry, meant 150, we learned from the British calendar domestic series for 1650, all right? On September 19, the Council of State orders 150 Scotch prisoners delivered to be sent to New England by John Foote. On October 23rd, it was ordered that they be shipped away forthwith, and on November 11th, that they be delivered to Augustus Walker, Master of the Unity for Transportation to New England. In 1650, Dr. Stone, a Massachusetts agent, bought several Scotch prisoners from Tothill Jail, London. Again, of the prisoners taken at Worcester, September 3, 1651, 272 were shipped to New England on the John and Sarah from London and arrived in Boston the following spring. You see all these indentured servants that are coming in? In the 1600s, these ain't Africans. You see who's their slaves first, right? From the 1600s. All right. Their names derived from the Hutchinson Papers were printed in New England Historical and Genealogical Register, all right? The number deported to Virginia from among the Scotch made prisoners at the Battle of Worcester was much smaller than is generally stated. Thus, in Bala's white servitude in the colony of Virginia, a recent issue of the Johns Hopkins Press, we read, of the Scotch prisoners taken at the Battle of Worcester, 1610 were sent to Virginia in 1651. Wow. Bancroft gives some countenance to such an assertion. But Bruce, though he loves to swell the number of political transports, says in his Economic History of Virginia, after the defeat of Charles II at Worcester, his soldiers who were seized on that occasion were disposed of the merchants and of at least 1,600 were thus conveyed to America. The parliamentary fleet in which they were transported sailed first to Barbados. We have certain information on the arrival of only 150 Scotch servants in the colony when the fleet arrived in 1651. You see, these ain't Africans. That the next winter, two vessels set out from London with prisoners designed for the plantations in Virginia. That in 1653, Richard Netherway of Bristol was permitted to export from Ireland 800 Tories, all right, from Ireland, all right? Now we got Irish here, all right? Who were to be sold as slaves in Virginia. Who Irish to be sold as what? Slaves in Virginia. These are not Africans. Now, are all these white people? I don't think so. You know, thinking logically, I know they were getting rid of the so-called black Irish too. All right. So a lot of these were also people you would consider Negro. All right. And these were the same people eventually that might come out in your census and your family census. Say, oh, I got Irish in me. Like, how the hell do I have Irish in me? Look at me. I don't got no traits of being so-called white. But, you know, a lot of this has to do with what we're reading right now. 
You know what I mean? So again, in, in 1653, this dude Netherway permitted to export from Ireland 100 Tories who were, who were to be sold as slaves in Virginia, and that other batches, some still larger, of Irish unfortunates were there imported. Again, Irish unfortunates. What's an unfortunate? Yet no proof appears that any of the Drogheda prisoners were transported to Virginia. Cromwell himself mentions Barbados as their destination. So even though, you know, if, even if they didn't land in Virginia, they were landing in Barbados in the Caribbean. A lot of these, uh, you know, they said, oh, they're supposed to be taken to Virginia when they were in England or Ireland or Scotland. But when they, when they got here, they were, you know, ending up in the Caribbean or somewhere else. The Scotch prisoners in the Preston campaign of 1648 were sent to Barbados, right? Some of the men that at that time brought into Virginia from New York as convicts were felons only in the eye of martial law. Hmm. Thus, previous to the year 1665, the English invaders of Long Island attacked New Amstel on South River. Many of the Dutch colonists, they sold as slaves in Virginia. You see that? So... When the Dutch were there running things, you know, that was Dutch lands. You know, New Dutch land, that was New York. New Holland, that was all New York. All right. And the Dutch had that colony. And when the English got there, enslaved some of these Dutch, right? And sold them as slaves in Virginia. Now, were all these Dutch white? I don't think so. So you've got to break that. we got to stop thinking when they're talking about Europeans that it's always going to be white. All right, so a lot of these so-called dark-skinned uh, Dutch as well were taken into uh, uh, plantations in Virginia and then mixed with operations from America. You know, and then you forget the whole history. Now you're just black. All right, so how do you have Dutch in your census record and <laughs> your family? All right, think about it. Other convicts guilty of no moral transgressions came from other colonies. Thus, the general court in Boston ordained that the Quakers who had not wherewithal to pay their fines, and they were enormous, should be sold for bondmen or bondwomen to Barbados, Virginia, or any of the English plantations. Again, bondmen, indenture, all right, a contract. You're bound to serve for a number of years, all right? That's what they did to the Quakers when the English got there. You see that? We're not talking about Africans. When we ha have have we read anything about Africans, right? After the Mar and Derwent Water Rising in 1716, two shiploads of defeated Jacobites out of His Majesty's abundant clemency were deported. All right. So now we've got we got into the Jacobites. I know a lot of people heard of the Jacobite Rebellion and all that in England, in Scotland, and all that area up there. You know. So a lot of these prisoners of war from the Jacobite rebellions were being sent over here as well. Again, after the Marin, there went water rising in 1716, two shiploads, two shiploads of defeated Jacobites, not Africans. Again, we're talking about slave ships. We're talking about two shiploads of slave ships, if you want to call them slave ships, because I bet you these are battalion ships. They didn't have no slave ships. Were defeated. Were Filled with defeated Jacobites. All right? Jacobites. Out of His Majesty's abundant clemency. These are English people. English, not Africans. Were deported 80 in the ship Friendship and 55 in the Good Speed and were sold in Maryland. I know I've heard these ships before. And we're going to get to uh, the story of this ship and the Jacobites. All right, right now. Let me just finish this paragraph. As it continues, says a most desirable class of political offenders would have come to both Virginia and New England. All right, POWs, they were sending them over here, prisoners of war, convicts, all that. And that in great numbers through the Conventicle Act of 1664. But that law which expelled from England a noble army of martyrs, all right, a noble army of martyrs. Who's these noble people they're taking out of England? Could these include so-called black people, noble black people? Martyrs expressly forbade transporting them to either Virginia or New England, and so they were consigned to the Torrid Sugar Islands. 
You understand? They mean they were sending them when they were because of political reasons or something, even though they, their intention was for them to go to Virginia and New England. There was when they got here, there was like trouble sometimes, so they would end up in in the Caribbean instead. They would be like, no nah, man, they can't. We can't have that here. Just just send them to the sugar plantations. If cargoes could not all be sold there, there is a reason to think that the remnant in some way was carried on into continental con colonies, all right? Talking about the Jacobites. Virginia in the present paper has been chiefly spoken of as the destination of convicts. All right, so real quick, I just wanna show you guys something I have here. Jacobite prisoner, all right, here we go. So look, it says names, age, profession, county, stature, and remarks. Yeah, so let's get this first person. I know you guys saw it already. James Nielsen. These are Jacobites, remember. James Nielsen, he's 26, he's a laborer. He's from Aberdeen. He's 5'5". Five five. He's what? Black, swarthy, and slender. Black, swarthy, and slender. The other guy is brown. Sandy hair, swarthy, brown. Well-made, brown, diddle, diddle, ruddy, diddle, 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 black, straight swarthy lusty light hair fair face all right brown well made swarthy swarthy black black all right hold up let me go back now all right this is an actual primary source right all right so i'm gonna read here this is extract from a list name in 150 jacobite prisoners taken by the french in october 1747 as recorded by w smith at lincoln york and lancaster this is the list referred to by Samuel Smith, which it was captured, all right? This is real history. Again, James Nielsen, what? He was black and swarthy. Black and swarthy. As you can see, swarthy, swarthy, dark, brown, black, brown, thick, fair complexion. We got a fair complexion guy here. We got a pale skin one. We got a pocket-pitted, pock -pitted, ruddy, dark complexion. Can it get any more clear than that? Dark complexion. Black man, hey, black man, who's the black man? George Hume, black man, black man. Again, these are Jacobites, swarthy, all right, dark brown. That's not, that's not black man. Again, black, swarthy, and slender, Jacobite, a real transcript. We're going to go back to the uh, presentation. It is made thus prominent in all documents which have come to the knowledge of the writer, but he is not ignorant that according to Dr. Land, all the nine colonies outside of New England were penal settlements, and that Lodge and other able writers maintain that Maryland received a larger felon quota than any other province. The whole number there, as estimated by Scharf, the Maryland historian, was at least 20,000, about half of them after 1750. We ain't talking about the bringing Africans. You got to really do research on real history so you can see that there is records that's telling you straight up who was really getting enslaved. And we already went over the Indian enslavement. They weren't bringing no Africans. They were enslaving the American Indians, the Spanish and Portuguese, and actually bringing them to the other side of the world and the other colonies, selling them to the English and other people. All right, so again, we got a whole estimate here by Scharf, a Maryland historian. 20,000, about half of them after 1750. In all cases where Maryland has been found coupled with Virginia, the writer has so stated it. The historical register now, and then mentions Maryland alone, saying that on October 4th, 1726, about 80 felons convict under sentence of transportation were taken out of Newgate and put on a ship board for Maryland in America. They were just snatching them up out of the prisons and put them in the ship, being joined on the river by several more convicts from Surrey and Kent. In 1665, certain convicts in England petitioned Her Majesty, the Queen Mother, in hopes she would order them sent to Mar her Maryland. So Comics were like, what? They're getting sent to Maryland again. What? Just working, then free, and then they get land, and then they, they don't have to be in prison? Sign me up for that. Oh, begging the queen, yo, send me over there. I'll be good. Send me over there. 
as late as 1769, 87 year convicts from Bristol are noticed by Sharp and Lodge maintains that such importations continued thereafter they had seized in other colonies, though such imports into Virginia were not declared illegal until 1788. Damage has been done. And again, we continue a little further down in the book, British convicts shipped to American colonies. All right, very scholarly article from the American Historical Review, volume two, number one, published by Oxford University. We continue on page nine as Bristol, according to Macaulay, was especially infamous for kidnappers. Remember the spirited, the spirits? So it shared largely in an allied branch of business, the traffic in convicts. It was big business, all right? Not in Africans, but what? Who? Convicts, undesirables, prisoners of wars. Hunt, the historian of that city, remarks, Towards the end of the 17th century, Bristol, aldermen and justices used to transport criminals and sell them as slaves or put them to work on their plantations in the West Indies. Who? Criminals, not Africans, criminals from England. A writer in notes and queries holds this Bristol industry to have arisen still earlier saying, when Cromwell and William as well had conquered Ireland the Irish officers sought safety on the continent, while the rank and file were pressed to enlist in foreign service. As many as 34,000 men were thus hurried into exile. Listen to this, all right? 34,000 widows and orphans. The government shipped wholesale to the West Indies. Wholesale to the West Indies. We ain't talking about Africans here. You gotta break the spell. Don't, don't, don't bring me your personal attachment don't be all hurt. Don't be all hurt because I'm telling you facts here. You can research all this. The American Historical Review they ain't playing. Right? 34,000 shipped wholesale to the West Indies. The boys for slaves. The boys for slaves. Not Africans. Who people from England, the women and girls from mistresses to the English sugar planters, the merchants of Bristol, slave dealers in the days of Strongbow sent over their agents to hunt down and ensnare the wretched people. Orders were given them on the governors of jails and workhouses for boys who were of an age to labor and women who were marriageable or not past breeding. In the foregoing notice of Bristol exports, the words West Indies probably mean the best American market no matter where. The best American market. Doesn't matter. There wasn't specifically the West Indies Caribbean. They're talking about anywhere in the Americas. That's what they're trying to tell you. So a lot of those 34,000 convicts that said they went to the West Indies, no, they just went to the open market over here on this side of the world. They, they landed in many places, those people, even in Virginia and Boston, New York. Some of those whom Bristol vessels had transported were brought to New England and sold there. You see, see, they didn't all go to the West Indies sugar plantations. You with the video. Bound over indentured servitude and American conscience by John Van Dersey. Introduction. On November 30th, 1774, the brig London packet docked at Philadelphia. Its chief cargo, not usual for the time, all right, not usual for the times. We're talking about 1774, right? Was 122 indentured servants, British and continental men and women who would be bound into servitude for an average of four, four years in exchange for passage. Probably some had agreed to a certain term in England. Others would have to bargain with agents, masters or ship owners here. A certain number may have been transported for criminal offenses. A few may have been kidnapped or Shanghai, Shanghai by unscrupulous labor contractors. All of these were common practices in the American servant trade. The American servant trade. All right. We're not talking about Africans here. We're talking about that in 1774. It was the usual thing to see ships come in full of people, full of indentured servants, ships, full ships. Ships, right? Servant ships or slave ships? What do you want to call it? Huh? They were packed in there like herons, remember? 
Now listen to this, except for the important distinction that their existence as individuals was acknowledged by law and that after their term or servitude, they were to be granted the full rights of free men and women. The status of these people was essentially the same as that of slaves. Again, the status of these people was essentially the same as that of slaves. This is slave. This is how slavery became. Should tell. It was through indentured servitude. They were extending these indentures for life. They, the work they did, and the clothes on their backs belonged entirely to their masters. They could be hired out, sold, or auctioned, even if this meant separating them from their families. They could be beaten, whipped, or branded, all right? This is where you get that whole story. Indentured servitude, these people went through that. If they ran away, they could be punished by an extension, often a multiplication of their term of servitude. In some colonies, runaways were hanged, a process too wasteful to apply to slaves who retained, after all, the value of capital. The resemblance to enslavement began at least at embarkation, where both voluntary and involuntary emigrants were herded on board. White Guinea men, it says they're white guinea men and crammed below decks in unsanitary conditions with insufficient provisions. This is the middle passage here. Again, middle passage. They're crossing the Atlantic Ocean from Europe and these conditions. All right, we're going to ignore this. You want to make up stories like Kunta Quinte. You want to put it, oh, it was Africans. It was all these Negroes. No, these are Europeans, both pale skin and melanated. Melanated Europeans as well, colored Europeans together. They were what? Being packed in these ships, crammed below decks in unsanitary conditions with insufficient provisions on the London packet. This had meant nine weeks of confinement in a stifling hold, nine weeks in the ocean, a middle passage in what? In a stifling hold and an outbreak of putrid fever that had swept through the entire ship. Five bodies had been thrown overboard en route, and no more than five people among the complement of indentured cabin passengers and crew had escaped infestation. You hear this? People will comment on my videos, and these type of videos especially, be like, but it's not the same. Nobody's comparing, first of all. But these people went through the same thing that you supposedly, Kunta Quinta went through. Supposedly, that's a fictional story. And I'm reading you a real story right now. You know, remember they're talking about the ship that came in with all these people. And it says, among the deceased cabin passengers was a marginally free man, a failed schoolmaster, staymaker, and preacher who had barely been able to scra scrape together the price of his passage. In this atmosphere of incarceration, disease, and fortified human rights, he made his passage to the New World, an appendage of a practice developed for the population of it. So this pa passage, remember this middle passage, right? Middle passage was a fearful demonstration of the fragility of human freedom, as well as the fierce price of sibling back into servitude. The experience was to mark the man, just as the deceased festering among the indentured below deck marked him now, leaving him so weakened that he had to be carried off the ship, disembarking only after the rest of the passengers and crew had left. Thus, Thomas or Tom Paine arrived in America. All right, they're talking about Thomas Paine. Who, who's this Tom Paine? He came in under these conditions. Who's Thomas Paine that came in under the slave conditions? We're going to go to uh, Britannica Encyclopedia.com uh, or Britannica.com and it's Thomas Paine, it says here, right? Now, Thomas Paine, it says here, born in uh, Norfolk, England. He died in 1809, New York, English-American writer and political pamphleteer whose common sense pamphlet and crisis papers were important influences on the American Revolution. So he contributed to the American Revolution, the same person who came in as a slave, remember, under those conditions that he had to be carried off the ship. He almost died on the way over here. All right, so we continue in this book. Um, and right here it talks about how Washington basically liked, uh, you know, this guy Thomas Paine's readings or his literature, what he wrote. And it says Washington, you know, we're talking about George Washington, moved by this article, ordered it to be read aloud to his brigades. He too, plantation owner, slaveholder, aristocrat, had been associated with indentured servitude. 
worked as a British officer in the French and Indian War, Washington had urged upon the colonial authorities the enlistment of servants in the Virginia volunteers, warning that if such provision were not made, servants would run off and enlist in the regular army anyway. He himself recruited numbers of indentured servants for his regiment, all these Europeans who they fighting. It is the forgotten social undercurrent of the American Revolution. All right. This is the true reason of the American Revolution. Indentured servants and all these Europeans fighting to fight their status and, and you know, for their freedom, their liberty. And the tyranny they were under, under indentured servitude, the desperate sucking tide that made the unthinkable challenge to the most powerful naval and military force on earth a worthwhile risk and prompted the guarantees of individual rights written into government that evolved afterwards. We are, in fact, as Americans, listen to what he's going to say, we are, in fact, as Americans, the descendants of bound people, all these Americans, all these white Americans, all these people talking about love it or leave it or, you know, this is the America you know, get out or go back to Africa, all that stuff. They are the ones descended from bound people. I've been showing you a lot in the other videos. How many hours in the other videos? How many sources did I show? And I got more sources on this part and I got way more to show. I don't know how many parts I'm going to do because it just keeps popping up because it is part of history. I keep finding this. It's part of history. It's real history. History they never told us about. History they sugarcoated, history they whitewashed, history they erased, history they hid. Because the fact is that most Americans are descendants of bound people. And we're not talking about the aboriginal, original people here that were never, ever bound. Tied now by that binding in ways we have forgotten, which it would serve us well to remember. Oh, it's going to, oh, they're going to remember now. Oh, they're going to hear it now. They're going to remember now. Ain't no turning back. From 1609 until well after the founding of the Republic, half of all the colonists who came to America arrived under some form of involuntary labor. And they're being modest here with these numbers. Half of all the colonists? How much millions is that? Do the numbers. Now times that times all their descendants that are alive today, how they multiplied and they call themselves the white, so-called white American, or what you want to call so-called black American. A lot of the so-called black Americans are descendants of the same European bound people of color. People of North Africa, uh, Sephardic Jews they didn't want, uh, Huguenots they didn't want, black Germans they didn't want, Protestants, Quakers, Swarthy, I'm talking about swarthy complexion Europeans. Yes, you can't deny that part if it's in your genealogy. Actually look into it and see what else you can dig on it. We got to accept every part of you. You know, if you have whatever you have in your family, you got to cherish it and, and understand it. Know who you are. Because, you know, again, from 1609 until way after, till basically ever, until today, <laughs> half of all the colonists supposedly came in as a, involuntary labor to them fell the largest share of the hardest work in an unfamiliar country they cleared the land again again all right this is a very scholarly book there's so many sources on this i already showed you in the beginning before i read it it's on the way in the back if you want to again verify all the info it's called bound over indenture servitude and american conscience all right that's the name of the book you can check out all the sources he has. You can verify all the information. We have already verified the information we're reading in this book. This is part four. But I want you to pay attention to what he's going to say. And he, what he just said, he said to them, to who? To these indentured servants, these convicts, these undesirables, these people they didn't want over there, political prisoners. All right. All of them. All these indentured servants, to them fell the largest share of the hardest work in an unfamiliar country. The hardest work, not to Africans. The hardest work fell to indentured servants from Europe. They cleared what? The land, drained the swamps, built the roads, first plowed the unbroken ground. They cooked and cleaned and nursed and midwifed. They worked and died in greater numbers than anyone else. 
There's were the hands and backs that work the transformation from wilderness to settled prosperity, a change so sweeping that its signs have vanished so that the completed colonies seem somehow to have sprung fully into being directly from their charters. In the process, these men and women, drifters and convicts, rogues and whores, and the chronically poor, reluctant, coarse, unpaid, overworked, overwhelmingly ignorant and unskilled vanish themselves, transformed into what we have come to think as of the American people. Any questions? Any questions? Right, that was so deep right there. I hope you understand. This is the main point I've been trying to show you. Deep. Right? And I hope you guys have been understanding the last three parts of this. Let them know, Kurimeo. When I was saying the invention of the white rays and how they created this segregation. Today, all these American people, right? All these American people, a lot of these American people descend from indentured servants, both pale skin and people of color. So when we're reading, don't just think white when I'm saying they worked the hardest jobs and all this. There's also colored people in this. When they're saying, because you, know, you know how we grew up and, and everybody always knew that it was the so-called slave, right? That built everything, the so-called slave. The Negro, right? So-called Negro or African slaves. Oh, they build the White House. They build the roads, right? Well, it was slaves slash indentured servants. And there was so-called Negroes in, in that mix. But there was also pale-skinned people, Europeans, Europeans, Europeans. To them felt the hardest work. To your Europeans who were coming here as indentured servants, both pale-skinned and so-called Negro. And with time. They vanished themselves. What happened to them? They transformed into what we have come to think as the American people. Mm, the American. But you want to keep associating yourself to being a slave or to everything that is slavery, everything related to slavery. That's what you keep wanting to associate yourself with, right? You want to identify as, as, as the persons who build the roads, who had to enslave, who had to go through all this hardship. That's what they want you to envision. But a lot of you, a lot of your ancestors were never even indentured servants or slaves and owned land and Fact. actually owned indentured servants. Fact. So this is just sign for you to think about. Again, we're in the book Bound Over, Indentured Servitude and American Conscience. They came as slaves. Vast human cargo transported on tall British ships bound for the Americas. They were shipped by the hundreds of thousands and included men, women, and even the youngest of children. Whenever they rebelled or even disobeyed in order, they were punished in the harshest of ways. Slave owners would hang their human property by their hands and set their hands or feet on fire as one form of punishment. They were burned alive and had their heads placed on pikes in the marketplaces as warnings to other captives. Now, do we really need to go into all the gory details? But are we talking about the African slave trade? Nope. King James II and Charles I also led a continued effort to enslave the Irish. Britain's famed Oliver Cromwell furthered this practice of dehumanizing one's next door neighbor. The Irish slave trade began when James II sold 30,000 Irish prisoners as slaves to the New World. His proclamation of 1625 required Irish pol political prisoners to be sent overseas and sold to English settlers in the West Indies. By the mid-1600s, the Irish were the main slaves sold to Antigua and Montserrat. At that time, 70% mm. of the total population of Montserrat were Irish slaves. Ireland quickly became the biggest source of human livestock for English merchants. From 1641 to 1652, over 500,000 Irish were killed by the English 
and another 300,000 were sold to slaves. Ireland's population fell from about one and a half million to 600,000 just in one single decade. Families were ripped apart as the British did not allow Irish fathers to take their wives or children with them across the Atlantic. This led to a helpless population of homeless women and children. Britain's solution was to auction them off as well. During the 1650s, over 100,000 Irish children between the ages of 10 and 14 were taken from their parents and sold as slaves in the West Indies, Virginia, and New England. In this decade, 52,000 Irish, mostly women and children, were sold to Barbados and Virginia. Another 30,000 Irish men and women were also transported and sold to the highest bidder. In 1656, Cromwell ordered that 2,000 Irish children be taken to Jamaica and sold as slaves to English settlers. Many people today will avoid calling the Irish slaves what they truly were, slaves. They'll come up with terms like indentured servants. This is to describe what occurred to the Irish. However, in most cases, from the 17th and 18th centuries, Irish slaves were nothing more than human cattle. If a planter whipped or branded or beat an Irish slave to death, it was never a crime. A death was nothing more than a monetary setback. England continued to ship tens of thousands of Irish slaves for more than a century. Records state that after 1798, the Irish Rebellion, Thousands of Irish slaves were sold to both America and Australia. One British ship even dumped 1,302 slaves into the Atlantic Ocean so that the crew could have plenty of food to eat. There's little question that the Irish experienced the horrors of slavery as much, if not more, in the 17th century as the Africans did. Mm. There is also very little question that those brown tan faces you witness in your travels to the West Indies are very likely a combination of Irish and African ancestry. In 1839... And we're going to correct, we're going to say Irish and American indigenous people. They weren't bringing Africans. What Africans? Britain finally decided on its own to end its participation in Satan's highway to hell and stop the transporting of slaves. While their decision did not stop pirates from doing what they desired, the new law slowly concluded. This chapter of nightmarish Irish misery. But if anyone, black or white, believes that slavery was only an African experience, then they have it completely wrong. Wrong. Irish slavery is a subject worth remembering. Remember. Not erasing from our memory. Remember. But where are our public and private schools? Where are the history books? Why is it so seldomly discussed? Do the memories of hundreds of thousands of Irish victims merit more than a mention from an unknown writer? Or is their story to be one that their English pirates intended? To, unlike the African book, have the Irish story utterly and completely disappeared as if it never existed. None of the Irish victims ever made it back to their homeland to describe their ordeal. These are the lost slaves. The ones that time and bias history books conveniently forgot. Lost slaves. If you want to know more about this subject, I honestly say that you should really check it out as I found everything that I read today from Google. It was very easy to search. I just typed in white slavery and started reading. And there's so much on the subject, but yet so little is taught in schools about it. It makes me wonder if 
really there is some kind of cover up from or by who I don't know, but it's just another story of untold history. And it certainly is hidden. Video. All right, we're in this other book, just to correlate with what we're learning today. It says Supplement to the Jail Review, Volume 10, Number 2, August 1901. It says here, Redemptioners and Indentured Servants in the Colony and Commonwealth of Pennsylvania by Carl Frederick Geiser, PhD. All right. Professor of Political Science, Iowa State Normal School, sometime assistant in American history at Yale University. And he says in the preface that this monograph is the attempt has been made to give a complete and accurate account of the institution of indentured servitude service as it existed in Pennsylvania in the hope of throwing some new light upon an important phase of our colonial history upon which comparatively, comparatively little has been written. Again, they never told us about this part of history. Large tracts of land were offered by Penn to adventurers at prices merely nominal and 50 acres of land were given for every servant brought into the colony. Similar concessions were made by the proprietors of New Jersey for its settlement, all right? So they were given all these servants, these undesirable convicts, felons, beggars, poor people, underclass who were being kidnapped a lot of the time. They were giving them 50 acres of your ancestors' land, land that didn't belong to anybody who was part of the everybody's. You can't own land. It's the great spirit's land. Hawa! It's your habitat, your promised land as a resource, not to own. But they were giving that land away. What? 50 acres to these undesirables from Europe? Indentured servants? Similar concessions were made by the proprietors of New Jersey for its settlement. In fact, such inducements were offered in nearly all the early colonies. All right. Now, dodge the hijack. Dodge your own hijack because a lot of these people were not just white. They were Negro Europeans, what you would say a Negro, the Moorish European, whatever you want to call them. All right. And is that why you have it in your census record or in genealogy that you're one of your ancestors might have been from Britain. But you're sure he was so-called Negro, right? Or was he white? Do you even know? All right, that's what I'm saying. There were A lot of them were so-called Negro too. Don't leave them out. All right? Now, these indentured servants, again, they were getting large tracts of land. All right? And that was happening in all the early colonies. All right? And they were making pamphlets and brochures and passing that all around England. Be like, look, look. You can live in the land of promise. You have lived the American dream. Generally speaking, the indentured servants were those immigrants who, unable to pay their passage, signed a contract called an indenture before embarking in, which they agreed with the master or owner of the vessel transported them to serve him or his assigns a period of years in return for passage to America. The master or owner of the vessel whose servants they they thus at once became on arriving in America, sold them for their passage to whom he pleased, usually to the highest bidder. The indenture was then transferred to the purchaser, who now became the master for the remaining period expressed in the indenture. You see this? It's business selling people, basically, your service. In the latter history of, of the institution, the term redemptioner becomes common, and many modern writers have failed to realize the distinction between redemptioners and indentured servants. The redemptioner, strictly speaking, was an immigrant, but an embarking agreed with the ship and merchant to be transported without an indenture and without payment of passage and on land in America to be given a short period of time and wish to find the relatives or friends to redeem him by paying his passage. If he were unable to find anyone who would redeem him in the time specified, the captain was at liberty to sell him to the highest bidder in payment for his passage in which case the redemptioner entered into the same legal relation or status as the indentured servant and was consequently governed by the same laws. In Germany, although the causes were of a lot different nature from those in England, the supply was no less real and abundant. The claims of Lewis, and it says there the 16th or the 14th, to the Palatinate, which was opposed by the German states in the Triple Alliance under the leadership of William of Orange, opens a period of devastation to that state, which caused thousands to seek homes in the American colonies, thousands of what? Germans. 
to avenge himself on that province and to weaken his enemies, Louis sent an army of 50,000 men in 1685 to ravage the country. Cities and villages were burned. The people were stripped of their possessions and were forced by the French to plow under their crops. Many perished and thousands were made homeless. A few years' immunity from plunder was followed by another invasion of a similar nature in 1693, the outbreak of the War of the Spanish Succession in 1701, the Palatinate being the pathway of the contending armies, added 13 years more of misery. To all this wretchedness, Louis furnished a climax by sending an army into the province in 1707 to repeat the rapine of former years. This was the beginning of the great German exodus to England and her colonies. And to the native population which flowed out of Germany at this time were added many of the French Huguenots who left their country on account of the persecutions of the king. When we consider that in addition to the ravages of war, the people in Germany, England, and Ireland were burdened with heavy taxes, distressed by political, social, and religious factions, it is not all strange that there should be a strong desire on the part of, of the restless population to seek homes in a new country. Free from wars, from party strife and social caste, the American colonies, of course, right? That's where they're going to go seek all that. In a large measure, we're free from these distressing misfortunes. So we didn't have all the stress, all this stuff they were going through, right? All their problems. 99 problems, but, right? It's not, but this is not one of them, <laughs> you know? And then what they wanted to do? come here where it's not here and then they brought that all that all that we live through now right what these they're describing these people living like we a lot of us live like that now right when this corporation we live in they brought that over to us and offered the desired opportunities the remoteness of the colonies and the lack of means to reach them were the chief barriers which interposed those who were without the necessary means of transporting themselves and who were assisted in various ways formed a large proportion of the population in many of the colonies. In Pennsylvania, assisted immigration begins with the founding and settling of the colony. Its history is concomitant, concomitant with that of free immigration. Indentured servants are mentioned in the earliest frame of Penn's government and continue to become a more important class with the increase of population. And we can the article on this website. This is from the North Carolina uh, Department of Natural and Cultural Resources says Black History Month, North Carolinians to remember. It's talking about John Chavis, all right? It says that John Chavis was a highly respected preacher and educator in the late 1700s who served three years in the Revolutionary War, listed as an indentured servant in Halifax County in 1773. And by 1789, he was recorded as a free Black owning one horse in Mecklenburg County, Virginia, all right? Venture servant, free. He had his contract. It was over. He got his freedom. Now we're going to go into this part of the video where this guy is actually talking about the Mayflower. In case you don't know, the Mayflower was all in mostly, <laughs> more than half of them were indentured servants and included Protestants, their party Jews, all that. So you, all this time we thought all these were white people, these pilgrims, so-called pilgrims. Now nah, a lot of them were indentured servants and convicts and stuff. Same thing. They were forced, some of them were forced to go on that ship. The Mayflower, actually, of the uh, Pilgrim Voyage, uh, on uh, three days before they, or two or three days before they, they landed, the, the, the majority of the people there, over 50%, were indentured servants. The, the, the majority of the people there, over 50%, were indentured servants. And uh, they staged a revolt on board. And uh, what came out of it is the famous document known as the Mayflower Compact, where uh, all the people there were uh, declared themselves uh, equal, free and equal. They um, uh, they revolted against the um, uh, against the form of servitude that most of them had been committed, had signed up to uh, um, uh, to put themselves under. Uh, well, in the colonies, the the, most of the colonies, or all of the British colonies, were really set up by corporations. And as soon as uh, possible, uh, people who were uh, hooked into it, who were often dentured servants, <clears throat> where they, they signed up for passage for a certain number of years, they would have to work to work off the, uh, the money 
that the passage caused. And uh, then they were able to get off on their own. And uh, they, as soon as they uh, got out, many of them just ran away and from a, uh, from that form of bondage and, uh, you know, went off into the wilderness. This is from the John Hopkins University Studies in Historical and Political Science by Herbert B. Adams. He's the editor. It says, history and past po politics and politics of present history. Freeman. Fourteen series. It says the fourth and the fifth. Slavery and servitude in the colony of North Carolina. By John Spencer Bassett, Ph.D., Professor of History and Political Science in Trinity College, North Carolina. And this is uh, back from uh, 1896 by the John Hopkins, Hopkins Press, all right, 1896. The first laborers that in the English took to the New World colonies were whites, who during the first years of their residence were obliged to serve the settlers in the capacity of bonded servants. These people were commonly called servants or Christian servants. Remember, we got this in the past parts. They were just labeling themselves Christians. They weren't really calling themselves white. Remember, that didn't exist for about 60 years after 1619. It didn't exist in any record. The whole It started way after classifying people as white. And remember, we got to be careful with that. And we know that a lot of these Europeans were not just pale-skinned white. All right? They were uh, so uh, people of color, too. And as such, are to be distinguished from slaves in regard to them, as well as to the slaves. Their history, as it related to North Carolina, begins in Virginia. There were three sources of the supply of these servants. There were indented servants, people of no means, who, by, who being unable to pay for passage to America, agreed to assign themselves for a certain period to some ship captain on condition that when he reached Virginia, he might transfer his rights for money to someone who would maintain and work the servant for the given period. Transported felons who were such criminals, vagabonds or other obnoxious persons were sent to the colonies by order of the English courts. All right. That was the most of them. That was the large part of them. Kidnapped persons. And here's another large portion of these indented servants. Kidnapped persons. Kidnapped. Usually children who were stolen by traders or ship captains in the London or Liverpool streets and taken to America, where they were assigned till of age to such planters as would pay the prices demanded for their passages. From these three sources, many people came to Virginia during the first 60 years of its settlement. Again, during the first 60 years, they didn't, there was no record of anybody calling anybody white. So whoever wrote this, talking about the first people who were enslaved, the first laborers were whites. And he's talking about the first 60 years. We already got in law books, statute books, we shown that they didn't have that anywhere until 60 years later, after 1619, after they started establishing their colonies and bringing in these uh, indented servants by the by the, you know large numbers. In the book it says in the early period of North Carolina there was continual complaint that people harbored runaway servants. All right, runaway servants. Governor Nicholson made the charge in 1691, and Edward Randolph, Surveyor General, repeated the charge in 1696. The situation of North Carolina was favorable to Virginia runaways. And it is likely that when servants left their masters in that province, they took refuge in the swamps and the forest to the southward. Who? Servants, not African slaves. Yeah. It's called levelers and fugitive uh, runaway advertisements and the contrast in political economies of mid 18th century. Massachusetts and Pennsylvania by Barry Levi, University of Massachusetts Amherst. Pennsylvania welcomed and thrived upon servants from Germany Scotland and Ireland, and many came. New England restricted their entry, attracted few servant immigrants, often scorned them, and largely used their own native-born population to do the hardest and most dangerous work. What are they talking about here? They used the Indians. Now, where did they say anything about Africans, right? Where did they say anything about Africans? I'm talking about German, Scottish, and Irish servants or slaves and then we're talking about native born people the people born in that area the indigenous people that's who they were putting to work 
a little further down, it says between 1720 and 1760, Wokek estimates that some 67,185 uh, German immigrants arrived at the docks in Philadelphia, at least half of as servants. So at least half of those were servants. All right. So what are we talking about? 33, 34,000. Uh, but they're saying at least minimum. So they don't know. They're giving you an, uh, 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 a sugar-coated number here. A hapless and failed English servant apparently invented the term best poor man's country to describe Pennsylvania, indicating how attractive it was to such European labor irrespective of his personal failure. The lure worked well. Between 1720 and 1760, in addition to German migration, about 20 ships, about 20 ships a year also arrived from Ireland. 20 ships from where? Ireland, not the Caribbean with a bunch of Africans or not from Africa with a bunch of Africans. It came from Ireland, 20 ships. Are we talking about slave ships? Oh, oh, but these ain't slave ships, right? They won't call these slave ships. Actually, find me one real slave ship that brought Africans. I'm still waiting. Most packed with servants for sale. Again, 20 ships packed, packed like sardines. We're going to read this later. Packed packed like sardines, packed with servants for sale. Who? Irish servants, not Africans. Are you starting to do the numbers? A steady flow of English servants also energized the economy. Although there were other forms of labor, Pennsylvanians came to rely on white servants and their descendants. On who did the Pennsylvanians come to rely on? On white, pale face, on white servants and their descendants. White, not Africans on white servants and their descendants. Now, if you want to see if these are all white people just because they're coming from Ireland, Scotland, and England, now that's a whole different ish story, right? They're letting you know real history here when it comes to slavery or servitude in America, chattel being chattel property or treated like chattel property. All right, and further down it says the racial situation was different among workers in Delaware Valley. There were white workers. Uh, they faced free labor markets and few privileges. It made more sense for them to run away from their contractual service obligations. Not surprisingly, an overwhelming majority of runaways in Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey were white. 89%, all right, 89% of the runaways. We're talking about runaways, right? And we always, they told us this was Africans escaping slavery. Harriet Tubman, right? So was, she, was Harriet Tubman helping these white indentured servants? Because it was 89% of them from Pennsylvania, Delaware, New Jersey. That's three states. That's a lot of people. And a mere 11% were so-called black, biracial, or Indian. That might be just one person right there. They might just be make, saying biracial because somebody looks mixed. They call somebody a crane color, so we cr uh, cross that out. Indian, well, that's you. Black is you. Biracial, well, they'd have to prove it. So, again, <laughs> I went another book from the John Hopkins University Studies in Historical and Political Science. And this is White Servitude in Maryland, 1634 to 1820 by Eugene Irvin McCormick, Ph.D., instructor in American History, University of California. And this is from 1904, all right? White servitude in Maryland. It says here, the system of servitude thus early established in Virginia was adopted by Lord Baltimore as the means of settling and developing the colony of Maryland. Too poor to send out settlers himself, he induced others to transport servants in return for grants of land and the new colony. All right, so he was trying to make people to finance, you know, the transportation of these uh, servants he wanted to colonize Maryland with. All right, this Lord Baltimore. All right, many who did not wish to go in person furnished Baltimore money for transporting servants and received their pay in lands. The servants usually signed a written contract called an indenture, which bound them to serve a master for a specific specified number of years and return for free transportation, food, clothing, and 50 acres of land. Remember the head right system from this contract, whether they signed it or not, all servants came to be called indented servants, whether they signed it or not. Remember by force that we're bringing people over here. Concerning the motives which led Lord Baltimore to found the colony of Maryland, there have been much dispute among writers on toleration 
by confining their attention to this religious controversy, they have apparently lost sight of the underlying principle in Baltimore's plans, which overshadowed all others, that of revenue. All right. It was a business. He wanted revenue. There is very little evidence to support the theory that Maryland was founded as a home for persecuted Catholics. All right, that's the story they told everybody. A majority of the first settlers sent out were Protestants. All right, Protestants. All right, just uh, want to read sign real quick here in chapter three. It says number and economic importance as the actual number of servants imported into Maryland and the ratio which they bore to the free inhabitants cannot easily be determined from the scanty records which have been left us. All historians of Maryland complain of the dearth of contemporaneous material. Outside of purely legal documents, the settlers have left, the, left us very few journals or records of historical value. All right, so now they're letting you know that here in Maryland, they don't really know how many really, how, how many indentured servants there really was, you know, or coming in or anything, or if there was more indentured servants than slaves or more European indentured servants than so-called Negroes uh, in indenture. You understand? So whatever numbers they ever gave you in history, it was all alive. They ever said, no, it was very few uh, indenture servants here. It was more so-called Negroes here as, in, as slaves. Well, that's a lie because they don't have any records. They, they, they're making things up. Or right? I just wanted to verify that here. They, they're letting you know here. Then it says, for some time after the founding of the colony, talking about Maryland, right? The servants came exclusively from Great Britain, Ireland, and Virginia. All right, not Africa, any of these servants. Of the original immigrants, the ratio of servants to freemen was probably about six to one. All right, more servants than freemen. In the assembly of 1637, which all freemen were required to attend, only 90 appeared either in person or by proxy, leaving about 220 who must have been servants. This would make the ratio at this time seven to three. The increase in this proportion of freemen was due to the expiration of some of the servants' terms and to the immigration from Virginia. So freemen also included, if there was a white indentured uh, European and he did his time in seven years and it was over, then he became a freeman. And we'll continue in the book, White Servitude in Maryland, 1634 to 1820 by Eugene Irvin McCormick. Um, we're in chapter eight now, and they're talking about the convicts, and it says here from the reign of James I of King James till the separation of the colonies from England, large numbers of convicts were annually transported to the 13 colonies, as well as the Barbados, Jamaica, and other islands, and influenced materially the history of both the mother country and the plantations, plantations these indentured servants, not Africans, to where? To the West Indies, Jamaica, Barbados, and the other islands, not Africans, indentured servants. The English kings ever solicitous about the want of laborers in America kindly consented to send over all their unmanageable subjects to become servants in the plantations, a kindness not always appreciated by the colonists. Convicts were sent to Virginia and Barbados before the founding of Maryland. But after the settlement of the latter colony and continually throughout the colonial period, she received her share. All right. Maryland got a lot of convicts, too. And in fact, a greater number than any other province. Mad convicts. A lot of the most convicts. Maryland was full of what convicts? The most were sent to Maryland. Called Kuo Home who made a special study of crimes and criminals in England, and speaking of transportation after 1718 says, the system continued for 56 years, during which period and until the commencement of the American War in 1775, great numbers of felons were sent chiefly to the province of Maryland. All right, all these felons. Available material furnishes no clue to the actual number of convicts sent to Maryland before the revolution. Strauss has estimated the number at least 20,000 and the annual importation between the years 1750 and 1770 at four to 500. So they don't know. Remember, they have no clue. They don't know. They're making this up. They're being modest and they're putting these in quotations. Remember, when they don't know something, they'll do this. They'll, do, they'll put their quotations on it, right? Because they don't really know. So judging from the newspaper records of the arrival of convicts at Annapolis and Baltimore, this estimate is too, not too high. If indeed it is high enough, other estimates have been made of the whole number of involuntary immigrants sent from the British Isles to the American plantations. Between 1717 and 1775, the number sent 
from the Old Bailey alone is thought to be at least 10,000, and the whole number from various places in Great Britain and Ireland at least 50,000. So it's here the greatest number of the seven-year passengers, that's what they call them because they were indentured for seven years, sent to the plantations were ordinary criminals from various jails of Great Britain and Ireland. Among them were men and women of all ages and descriptions. They represented all crimes. If some of the offenses may be so classed, some stealing a loaf of bread to sustain life, to highway robbery, all right, from petty crimes, to, you know, big, big crimes. And a lot of them wasn't even their fault. They were just hungry. The worst criminals were seldom transported, but were executed in large numbers after every session of the court. The number was augmented at various times by the transportation of rebel convicts. Most of these were sent to the Barbados and other islands. They sent them to Barbados, right? So they couldn't escape. So a lot of these, when they say rebel convicts, what are they talking about? Like Jacobites, you know, Quakers, Protestants, or what, what are they talking about? What kind of rebels? Most of these were sent to the Barbados and other islands, but during the 18th century, some were sent to New England, Virginia, and Maryland. In the summer of 1717, 135 Scotch rebels were sent to Maryland and sold as servants. All right? It is difficult to tell from the court records and state papers where the great number were sent, as there is seldom any more specific destination given than the plantations or the West Indies. All right, again, where? plantations, plantations working in the fields, cotton fields, but tobacco fields, sugarcane fields. Yes, not Africans. These are indentured servants from where? Europe. And what did they have here? They had local labor as well. Your answer, the aboriginals that were already here, right, working with these indentured servants. That was you over here. In the calendar of state papers for December 13, 1666, there is an interesting entry concerning the disposition of Scotch rebels. The resolution about the Scotch rebels is to hang all ministers and officers of the common sort. One in ten is to be executed, one forced to confession, and the rest sent to plantations. The rebels sent to the West Indies in the 17th century were required to serve ten years. In a letter of the king to the governor of Jamaica, he instructs the governor that all the late rebels sent to Jamaica, who's these rebels, are these Jacobites, who's these rebels being sent all right, who are these people? Are these royal black nobles being sent to Jamaica and the West Indies Islands? It says, shall serve their masters 10 years without permission to redeem themselves by money or otherwise till that term be expired. The governor is ordered to propose a bill to the council and assembly for enforcing the order. The term of service for the Monmouth rebels, the Monmouth rebels, right? There we go. Sent to Barbados was also 10 years while ordinary servants were bound for only four years. So as the following are examples of many notices found in the magazines. All right, so this is an example of what they were saying in those times. It says 430 rebel prisoners from the gals of Carlisle, Lancaster, Chester, York, and Lincoln from England, right, were transported this month from Liverpool for the plantations, all right? Who? English people or English indentured servants to the plantations. Eight of them were drowned by boat over Saturn, not being able to swim because they were handcuffed. So eight of these prisoners or rebels drowned because they had them handcuffed and their little boat overturned. You see that? That's cruelty. This number with the rest makes about a thousand transported. 105 felons, convict taken out of Newgate, the Marshal Chelsea, and several other county gals were put on shipboard to be transported to Maryland. Felons transported from Newgate, May 17, 1736, four for life, three for 14 years, and 100 for seven years. You hear that? Four were going to work for life. Four were going for life, for life. Chattel property. You were, what? An indentured servant for life. Four of them already had that before going over there. These are Europeans, not Africans. And a hundred of them for seven years. The Maryland Gazette records the arrival of many convict vessels all through the 18th century. Loads of 50 to 100 or more were regularly landed at the ports of Baltimore and Annapolis, especially the latter city. The editors of the day frequently indulged in jokes at the expense of this class of immigrants. For example, the Maryland Gazette gives the following account of the arrival of a convict ship at Annapolis. 
And it says here, Friday, last arrived here from London after a passage of 29 days. All right. After a what? A middle passage. After a middle passage, right? They crossed the Atlantic, right? Oh, this one doesn't count. Oh, and this is not considered a slave ship. All right. So 29 days at sea, middle passage. Captain James Dobbins in the Thames Brigade with 130 of his majesty's passengers who were of the home so expert and known in some arts that they were obliged to travel for the better people of his majesty's american plantations at least for the term of seven years all right because of their arts they were making fun of them but the newspapers did not give a complete record of the arrival of these vessels in maryland the advertisements for runaway comics often state that they came at particular time and in a particular ship no account of which is given in the papers large therefore as the recorded numbers appear, the actual number was much greater. So even though we have some records of numbers, it was much greater. It was it was way more than they're telling us. Way more numbers of indentured servants over so-called African slaves. And we continue in the book, White Servitude in Maryland, 1634 to 1820. And they get to the conclusion, they're saying that importation of servants into Maryland from Great Britain and Ireland seems to have reached its height about the middle of the 18th century, talking about the 1700s, from the time down to the revolution. The number of voluntary servants brought into the colony gradually diminished. Convicts, on the other hand, came in ever-increasing numbers. So convicts were one of the major sources of Maryland servants. And during the 20 years which preceded the revolution, Maryland received nearly all that were transported. After the revolution, Maryland was getting all the, all the felons, all the convicts. As slavery was firmly rooted in Virginia, there was little demand for convict labor and laws were enacted to exclude them. In Pennsylvania, the German immigrants more than supplied the demand for servants. All right, we got that already, all the ser German indentured servants that were there. All right. And the convict element there was in, insignificant. But in Maryland, the contractors always found a ready market for his majesty's passengers, in spite of their sentiment against them. <laughs> and we continue in the book, Colonists in Bondage, White Servitude and Convict Labor in America. Chapter 2, The Trade of Servants, Two Controlling Factors. Governor Sharp of Maryland wrote in 1755, the planters' fortunes here consist in the number of their servants, all right, who are purchase at high rates. They're purchasing who? Servants. These are not Africans. Much as as the estates of an English farmer do in the multitude of cattle. All right? Purchasing people like cattle. Purchasing servants like cattle. A member of the Council of Maryland said that experience had shown that in all plantations were, where servants worked in the tobacco fields, in where? In the tobacco fields, in the tobacco fields, their labors would produce a yearly profit of 50 pounds sterling apiece, and commonly more. The Assembly of Barbados lamented in 1667 that in their island, the planter lies under great charge and duty without much produce for want of such servants. The president and the president of the Council of Pennsylvania told Governor Shirley of Massachusetts in 1756 that every kind of business here, as well as among the tradesmen and mechanics, as the planters and farmers, is chiefly carried on and supported by the labor of indentured servants, 1756. All right, all the way from 1607, we're talking about more than 100 years of them bringing in indentured servants. You understand how much uh, population growth? If in 1756, they're still being supported by the labor of indentured servants, when did the so-called African slave to begin? Why would they still be paying high prices for white servants when they can go get Africans in 1756, supposedly, right? That's what they told us in school. Why would they pay if they can get free, right? And, what, and these indentured servants, remember, they had to feed them, clothe them, and give them contracts at the end. The contract would expire. Why would they do that? You understand? This is actual history right here. All right, I want to read uh, this book now. Uh, it's called White Servitude in uh, Colonial South Carolina by Warren B. Smith. This is from the University of South Carolina Press. This is from 1961, and these are the contents of the book. The first fleet to sail for Carolina stopped at the island of Barbados to pick up men and supplies. Thus, many of the first settlers of Carolina came from Barbados. Right, we already know they were sending so many European indentured servants and convicts and all these people, rebels, political prisoners to Barbados from England and Ireland. 
In the proposals of the Barbados men to settle in Carolina can be found the statement, there are many hundreds of noble families and well-experienced planters that are ready to move speedily, dither with Negroes and servants. The public records of England indicate quite clearly that many, many, all right, again, many white servants were sent to Barbados, like I was just letting you know, right? This is history, all right? So who were they really bringing up from Barbados? You think it was Africans? In March 1655, the Council of State directed the governor of Tynemouth Castle to certify the number of prisoners taken at Dunbar, that they might be sent to Barbados. All right. In August 1655, the Council of State ordered the transportation to Barbados of all prisoners lately committed to the Marshall Sea who were taken in the breast man of war. In September 1655, the Council of State commanded the commissioners of the Admiralty to give orders for the for those English, Scotch, Irish, and Dutch mariners, prisoners in the castle of Plymouth to be sent to Barbados. All right, like I was just saying, all right, this is real history. They ain't, it's not Africans they're sending to Barbados. In 1661, the Council and Assembly of Barbados passed an act for the good governance of servants. Now, remember, now we're talking about 1600s. Remember, let's not leave out all the New England tribes and all the American Indian uh, people that were being sent down to Barbados as well. During the latter half of the 17th century, a constant stream of petitions flowed from home from Barbados requesting the sending out of white servants. These facts are proof of the acceptance of the institution of white servitude by the Barbadians and therefore indirectly by the first settlers of South Carolina. It would not be un reasonable to expect that among the Carolina immigrants were some who were already servant indentures and inured to the conditions of such servitude, all right? It's not unreasonable to expect that these immigrants were indentured servants. These first settlers were indentured servants themselves. This is not merely a matter of inference. Proof can be found in the passenger list of the Carolina one of the three ships that sailed for Carolina from England. Again, from England in 1699. I bet you they're going to find colored people in that ship and they're not Africans. In this ship, there were 16 passengers who brought a total of 63 servants, as well as 13 passengers who had no servants. The complete list of names follows. All right, and this is the names. Captain Sullivan. All right. I guess these are the people and their servants. All right. So we're assuming these are all white people. This is what we're assuming. But don't assume that. There's colored people in here too. It is true that no statement is made as to the character of service to be rendered by these servants. Possibly some of the above were paid personal servants. But the more likely presumption is that many of them were indentured servants. That's the reality. Just prior to the departure of this fleet, the proprietors had offered a head right of 150 acres of land to every freeman coming out before March 25, 1670. Again, 150 acres of whose land? Whose land they're taking and giving away to these indentured servants as a head right system? Like as freedom dues for completing their time and or for setting up a plantation. Plus 150 acres for every able manservant carried with him and 100 acres for every woman servant and for every manservant under 16. You hear this? The amount of land to be granted for transporting servants was to be reduced each year for two consecutive years. The greatest advantage therefore pertained to bringing servants to the province during the first year. Continuing further down says the Carolina, again the ship that brought the servants from England, uh, still under the command of Henry Brain, returned in the fall of 1670 to Barbados to pick up second load of colonists, right, so-called colonists. Among these were indentured servants. Probably most of them were indentured servants. They were going to go pick up. They needed labor. Their names and the time that each had yet to serve were proved before Thomas Gray. So, again, this is an example. Thomas Whitty, a sawyer, sawyer is to serve two years. He still had two years left. Uh, he was serving time. To us, Patterson, a carpenter, is to serve two years. All right. So these are the examples. So you see these people were being sold and transported like property. 
and their service uh, basically be sold. John Radcliffe, the last named, developed a, a decided passion for troublemaking and occupied considerable space in the early records of the colony. Indentured servants were among the earliest arrivals in Carolina, both from the mother country and from the islands, all right? From the islands, what? Caribbean islands, mother country? They're not talking about Mama Africa here. They're talking about mother country, their mother country, England, the mother country, the British Isles. And then what islands? The Caribbean. They ain't talking about Africa here. So again, the labor, the indentured servants slash slaves that they were uh, using, again, were from the mother country and the England or the Caribbean. They weren't coming directly from Africa uh, series. There's so many books. I can do so many series, but I just want you to, hopefully it's clear by now. And if you're doing the numbers and you see, and I'm going to different states, different references, different sources saying the same thing. Where's the Africans come in at all? The reason for the introduction of white service into South Carolina fall under the three general heads to aid in the settlement of the country. All right. They needed to make create colonies and plantations right to meet the labor shortage all right well, so, well why didn't they just go to africa then no they had their own labor right they had local labor here the aboriginals and they had their own undesirables and convicts and all these people they needed to bring over here and get rid of and to defend the colony the initial need of course was for the settlement of the country we continue in the book white servitude in colonial south carolina all right, a uh, very scholarly book from the University of South Carolina. And these are just copies of indentures. So says indentures of white servants were copied in the records of the register and secretary of the province. Now in the South Carolina archive, these two dated 1669 and 1671-72 were among the first recorded. So they're talking about this one right here. And this one says this indenture. All right, starts out with that. There's another one right here. This indenture. It says above another early indenture dated 1673, the inventory below is proof positive that there were white servants in South Carolina in 1718. All right, 1718 still what? White servitude. Where's the Africans? Right now, when they so how do they get white people from from this? Right, where do you see the people? So they're saying white. Remember, they're saying white because these are Europeans. So we we are to assume that these are all white people. All right, but yes, a lot of these were white people. I'm just saying, don't leave out the colored Europeans. In June 1756, Governor Littleton reported that the whole number landed here was 1,023 of whom 109 have died and 273 have been shipped off or made their escape. Some had been put to work on fortifications, but their behavior was disquieting, largely by reason of their own claim that they were prisoners of war. They did not come as servants. They were people who had been forcibly disposed, all right, these prisoners of war, these rebels, right? Perhaps no other colony could have handled the matter as South Carolina finally did. In 1712, the care of the poor had been put under the charge of vestries and church wardens. So when the Acadians became charity cases, the obligation for their keep became largely an item of parish administration. The French Huguenots, again, I was just saying, right? The French Huguenots had settled along the Santee River. So it is not surprising to find Arcadians sent to Prince Frederick Winya. The vestry books of this parish record a number of large families, a portion among the regular parishioners. On April 4th, 1759, over 3,000 pounds uh, was allowed for maintenance of the French Acadians. All right, look at the parentheses, right? French Acadians, what are, what are they really? Two-thirds of this went to the church wardens of St. Philip's, Charlestown. Continuing the book, uh, White Servitude in Colonial South Carolina. We're in chapter four, and it says here, sources of supply, right? After consideration of the various reasons for introducing white servants, attention should next be given to the sources from which they were drawn. Disbanded soldiers, defeated rebels, orphans, convicts, destitute Irish, and poor Protestants made up the more important contributing groups. In 1697, the Council of Trade and Plantations was concerned whether the king would be pleased to be at the charge of transporting any disbanded soldiers to the colonies. The end of the war in Europe should have provided an opportunity at this time for new servants. Convicts were among those brought out of Carolina as servants. All right, an advertisement was run in the Gazette during the fall of 1739 for two runaways from Virginia. Two years later, Robert Ellicott, a convict felling, 
was advertised for in the same newspaper. One report from Georgia referred to Thomas Wright, a transported convict who had gone with several traders to Carolina. Yet on the whole, the average servant in South Carolina was perhaps of a higher type than those in the other colonies. At least the leaving of social outcasts was remarkably few as far as the records of the colony indicate. It says here in 1672, Jamaica declared that whereas di divers thefts, diverse thefts, felonies, and other enormities have been committed lately on Port Royal, which cannot be imputed to anything but the greater number of malefactors and other convicts yearly brought from His Majesty's presence in England. Where's the descendants for all these people? Shouldn't Jamaica be more white? Now, all these Jamaicans, are they all aboriginal? And that's what I'm trying to let you guys to think about. Right? And it's not to bash anybody or make anybody feel any less aboriginal, but look into your own family history. And, you know, you might have melanated Europeans as your ancestors. But, you know, we're talking about so-called Negroes, mm. uh, Europeans, mm. or so-called Black Irish, Black English, Black Scottish people, you know, coming down or being sent to Jamaica as convicts, rebels that they lost. Remember, remember moms rebelling, all these things, uh, you know, undesirables. Tina says the destitute Irish represented another important source of servants. All right, the Irish, right? The presence of large numbers of destitute people at home had provided a supply, especially in the early 17th century when the economic writers still felt England to be overpopulated. With the coming of the Industrial Revolution, ideas about overpopulation changed. There was less reason to believe that England was overpopulated and therefore the destitute Irish became a principal source of indentured servants for the colonies. Remember, there was many people living in Ireland already that had been outcasted to Ireland from England, from uh, Scotland, Germany, France, all these places. Many of these servants were carried out to the colonies. And a lot of these people were carried out to what? The American colonies. The mercantile firms, as importers of servants, were not too careful about their treatment. As the more important purpose of the transaction was to get ships over to South Carolina, which could carry local produce back to Europe. Consequently, the Irish, as well as others, suffered greatly. This was particularly true during the period when slave importations into Carolina had been prohibited. It was almost as if the British merchants had redirected their vessels from the African coast to the Irish coast. Huh, they had redirected. They were never going over there, at least not to bring anybody to America. With the white servants coming over in much the same fashion as the African slaves. What African slaves? But they're telling you straight up right here. I right, pulled the baby from the water. All right, they're letting you know. Same thing. Just like they were treating the uh, indentured servants. It was the same. Cramming them up in these ships, bringing them in these horrible conditions. Nathaniel Russell described in 1767, just after coming to Charlestown as agent for Rhode Island merchants, the barbarous conditions under which the Irish were brought in. About six weeks past, a ship arrived here from Belfast with a number of passengers. The owners of merchants or merchants there being very anxious to procure as many passengers as possible. Instead of 200, which was the most they could bring with comfort, they brought out 450 and their agreement was for 19 inches room and with for each person, but they scarcely had seven. There being so much crowded and the bad usage they met with, from the master of the ship who cut them off in their allowances of prov provis, almost three quarters brought on a distemper, which carried off upwards of a hundred on the passage. The survivors were in a most pitiful condition. When they arrived here, there were many parents who buried all their children and many children without parent, friend, or relation. As soon as they landed, they were ordered into the barracks, the church wardens, immediately carried about subscriptions to raise a sum of money for their relief, and in two days had upwards of 200 pounds sterling subscribed exclusively of blankets, linen, cloths, and every necessary that the sick and naked stood in need of. You see how they were bringing these people over here, right? Continuing the book, uh, White Servitude in Colonial South Carolina from the University of South Carolina. We're in Chapter 5. And they continue talking about the sources of different uh, indentured servants. Um, and this is about the poor Protestants of Europe. All right, they say it's here by far the largest number 
And certainly the most important group of the white indentured servants were the poor Protestants from Europe. All right. So real quick, I want you to dodge the hijack big time. Big time. No, history tells us a lot of these Protestants, you know, especially the Haganuts, the Haganuts were mixed with a lot of Moriscos and Sephardic Jews who had converted over to Christianity. Uh, these were largely voluntary immigrants seeking to escape a condition become intolerable at home because of economic, religious, and political oppression. As these conditions were more or less prevalent in all parts of the European world, there was a sprinkling of many nation nationalities among the colony's servant class. Of course, since the Catholics were discouraged from coming, the immigrants were re representative of the northern Protestant nations. And this is an ad from uh, 1749. It says, to be sold on board the Georgetown galley. That's the ship. Thomas uh, Craft made master line at the Franklin's Wharf. Sundry English, English servants, men, women, well recommended, amongst whom are tradesmen, husbandmen, and indented for four years. Uh, it says here, run, another one, runaway, three white servants. Oh, this is a runaway ad. Check it out. It says, wait, three white servants lately imported. So three runaway white servants, all right? This is an ad about the German Palatine, a Palatine servant. All right, so all these ads existed in these years. So it's down here, the arrival of servants was advertised in postscript to the South Carolina Gazette, November 27, 1749 above, and they ran away. The Gazette notified South Carolinians to be on the lookout for them. So, oh, okay, so these people, same people that had gone in there from England had run away right away. You see that? Right away, as soon as they got here, these ain't Africans. And continuing the book regarding the Protestants, right? I just want to uh, get some uh, uh, numbers here of certain and certain ships, loads of Protestants. So, quoting here it says, just before this act was passed, the governor announced to the council that two vessels are at present in this harbor with upward of 800 foreign Protestants on board, and two others are hourly expected with the like number ships. You, you hear this, right? Vessels with 800 people, and they were expecting more coming in. So these are all servants, right? What they would call slaves, indentured servants. Where's the Africans? Continuing, says January 31st, 1753, says Dawes Ross and ship Elizabeth arrived from Rotterdam with 319 Protestants on board from Germany. All right? Where all these people pale skin or white just because they were coming from germany that's what you got that's the, the hijack you got to dodge this is what i'm trying to make you aware of we can't assume these were all white people i know in this book it keeps saying white servitude white white because they want you to think that everybody in europe was white just like they want you to think that everybody who's being called negro was from africa and that's not true it's the same thing all right so look at all these numbers, all these shiploads of these Europeans coming as indentured servants. This is the labor force, not Africans. This is 1753. 1753. Why are you paying people? Because you got to pay these people, right? You got to give them their freedom dues. Why are you still paying them when you got Africans? Free labor. So it's down here. Miss Jenny Reville has compiled a list of many German, Irish, and French Protestants. All of the important groups that came in from February 19, 1763 through January 23rd, 1773, are listed below. February 19th, 1763, 70 Irish petitions for lands in Boonesboro Township. And it says here, uh, and given the, the date, you see the day, 89 poor Protestants from Ireland, 150 poor Protestants from Ireland. And different date here, 45 Germans petition for land. It says here, 81 French Protestants, these French Protestants, these hugging nuts. All right, December 24, 1764, 56 German Protestants. Over here it says 306 Germans, 59 German, 80 Irish Protestants, 192 Germans from Rotterdam, 51 Irish, 128 Germans from Amsterdam, 155 Germans, 172 Irish, 227 Irish. Look at the dates. 437 Irish, 201 Irish. Look, these are Protestants supposedly. 414 Irish, the dates. 268 Irish, 231, 238. All right, you see the number 418 Irish. The evidence is thus plentiful that thousands of poor Protestants, thousands, thousands of poor Protestants came to Carolina as indentured servants or as redemptioners. Again, the letting you know in this book that there's strong evidence that thousands and thousands of poor Protestants came into Carolina as indentured servants. This is just the Protestants. 
all right? Every other group is not even being counted that came in Carolina right now, all right? So remember that all these Protestants, South Carolina, we're going to get this in another video, the French Huguenots, what they have to do in South Carolina, and who are they? Protestants as well. Uh, it's called plantation production and white proto-slavery, white indentured servants, and the colonization of English West Indies, 1624-1645, all right? So indentured servants where? In the Caribbean, West Indies, plantation and production in white proto-slavery. And this is from the Americas, volume 41, number three, from January 1985. You can find this on pages 21 to 45, about 25 pages published by the Cambridge University Press. So it says here, the effective colonization of these islands. And they're saying St. Christopher, which is St. Kitts, in 1624, Barbados, 1627, Neves, 1628, Montserrat and Antigua in 1632. Remember that Montserrat, we did a, a, you know, we covered that, um, you know, it was indentured servants, Irish indentured servants that were sent over there. And remember the guy was saying that it was supposedly for a hundred years, the first hundred years, it was a white colony. It was all indentured servants of white people because they were Irish. They were saying white, but these were also, you know, included people of color. And a lot of these so-called Montserrat people are, are the original black Irish, actually. And they don't, you know, they, they celebrate it. You know, they said, go to St. Patrick's Day in Montserrat. You'll see what I'm talking about. So and continue says what's possible. So these islands were, were possible because of early emergence of large plantations which were clearly designed for large-scale production and the distribution of commodities upon the world market. They were instrumental in forging an effective and profitable agrarian culture out of the unstable frontier environment of the 17th century Caribbean. These plantations therefore preceded, again, preceded the emergence of the sugar industry and the general use of African slave labor. So they're saying, you know, you we're going to dust the hijack. Again, what's African slave labor? It's a very small percentage. We're talking about European indentures and, and the aboriginals in America being put into an indenture as well. But again, they're letting you know in this article, right, that this uh, indenture service, this this it, this preceded, all right, this this was before this this these agrarian culture plantations, these plantations that preceded were before so-called Africans were coming before, all right, that, their whole story. Kunta Kinte, right? They developed during the formative years when the production of tobacco, cotton, and indigo dominated land use and utilized predominantly European indentured labor, okay? Predominantly European. These were, these were the people. So when they're telling you they founded all these with African slaves, Barbados was founded, by, and, 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 and all these islands were founded, by, that's a lie. They're telling you straight up right here. It, it was it was indentured service, and we already know we've already read out numerous um, sources telling the same thing. The structure of land distribution and the nature of land tenure systems in the pre-sugar era illustrate this. Most planters who accelerated the pace of economic growth in the late 1640s and early 1650s by the production of sugar and black slave labor, so-called black. That's the hijack. We already know indentures started to continue up until the 1800s. Already own substantial plantation stock with large numbers of indentured servants, right? So even before they start keep trying to throw in those tags, African black, they're letting you know the drop in between that these were plantations were stocked with what? Large number of indentured servants, not Africans, stocked with indentured servants. Continuing in this article in uh, part two. It says the system of commodity production was built upon the labor of thousands of indentured servants importing from England, Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. All right. These were the people that were supplying this Caribbean plantations, the early colonies with. And it was Europeans, again, not Africans. Unlike the Spanish settlements in the Greater Antilles, Barbados and the Leeward were not densely populated with Indians who could be reduced to chattel slavery. All right. So unlike, again, what are they letting you know here? Major drop right here. Like, again, like I told you in my video, you know, who, were their, who the Spanish and Portuguese were really enslaving. Who were they really enslaving? 
when they're talking about all these uh, uh, so-called Negroes that the Spanish and the Portuguese were supposedly transporting everywhere in all their colonies. These were Indians, like they're letting you know here. It's not like the Spanish settlements, right? Which they had, what? A bunch of Indians to what? Enslave or put into chattel slavery or your aunt, right? The aboriginals. They weren't talking about Africans there either. The islands were part of the wider environmental and political network of the Caribs who inhabited the Lesser Antilles. The Caribs, like the European invaders, were a militant and imperial people who were in the process of establishing their pinch money in the Eastern Caribbean. So they're talking about how, you know, when this, the Europeans got here, they noticed how the Caribs were kind of like trying to invade the Arawaks. They did invade the Arawaks and the Arawaks would have beef with them. They would tell them stories about how they had beef with the Caribs and the Caribs were kind of like, you know, conquerors, you know. Their cultural matrix made any form of labor subjection by the Europeans very difficult. To 30, the French missionary, French missionary, is he a hug and nut? who was familiar with the Caribs, noted that they possessed an innate contempt for manual labor, which drove them to launch a full-scale guerrilla war against the Europeans. They won some battles and killed a large number of whites, but eventually, over the 17th and 18th century, they were defeated and eliminated by Anglo-French Anglo -French and Dutch military pressures. To clear the very forested land, very forested land initiate production the english in the west indies had therefore to look outwards for a labor supply like the french in the new world they looked firstly to their homeland for this labor supply and so just like the french the french did the same what did the french do when they needed a labor supply they went to their country france or wherever they had colonies in europe or wherever they were possessed right and they brought their in their homeland, they brought people, their own people over here, undesirables, convicts, same thing. And they didn't go to Africa. So what did the English do? They looked first in their homeland. They didn't go to Africa. They told us growing up that as soon as right away they went to Africa. They never told us anything about them going to their homeland in Europe to get slaves or labor supply. You know, when they wanted sugar coated. The slave trade from Africa was not fully established in the early 17th century. It was no such thing as an African slave trade. And it never was established. That's the whole point. See, now, when we, when, right now in this article, and most articles we read, they always want to say, well, this preceded. This was before. When did it actually start? Show me the sources. Show me the ships. Show me the voyages. Show me what country they went to. Show me what tribe they took. Show me what port they landed on. Who they were sold to. All this stuff was recorded. Remember, this is the company. This is a business they're running. They don't take losses. They don't take risks. It's a business venture. So again, the slave trade in Af from Africa was not fully established in the early 17th century. Duh. And it was a virtual monopoly of the Iberians and the Dutch. It was what? A monopoly from who? Iberians. Who's the Iberians? Iberians. They're talking about Iberia. Who, who owned Iberia? Who's the Iberians? Talking about Spain, right? Iberia is not just Spain and Portugal. It also includes a little bit of North Africa. A lot of the Mediterranean is Iberia. Iberians monopolizing. And the Dutch. The price of slave labor from Africa was prohibitively expensive. And the English were not familiar with black slavery as an institution which made the dependence on British labor more complete. Again, what? The English was not what? Familiar with what? So-called black crayon color slavery, an institution which made the depends on British labor more complete. They didn't know anything about that nonsense. They don't know nothing about Kunta Quinte or, or, or you know, any any uh, roots, you know, fictional stories. They don't know nothing, nothing about that. So they went to where, they, logically, where they can get their uh, slave labor from, their homeland, and from the Indians locally. It was common practice in 17th century Britain for farmers to hire labor by the year for agriculture and artisan work. The most logical step was therefore to demand labor from England under temporary indenture. Not for a year, but for anything between 3 to 10 years. The planters would pay the passage, feed, clothes, and shelter the servant in return for their labor. At the end of the indenture, the servant would be given a freedom due of 10 pounds or a piece of land it was legitimate and acceptable within the labor tradition of english society all right this is the real slavery right here indentured servitude not remember 
they would do things so you wouldn't get your land so you wouldn't you know be able to get your freedom dues they extend your contract you get trapped in this circle of indentured servitude and that is what became chattel slavery what we thought in 38 peter hay noted that a plantation in this place barbados is worth nothing unless there be good store of hands upon it these hands were shipped out from britain and white workers under indenture became the mainstay of the colony in 1645 george downing wrote to john winter governor of massachusetts a man that will settle there west indies must look to procure servants which if you could get out of england for six or eight or nine years time only paying paying their passages or at the most but some small above it would do very well for so you shall be able to do something upon a plantation again when where's the africans you know when you start reading real records we start going through all these colonial primary sources you know what primary means from people from those times speaking personal accounts talking about hey go to england Go here, go here, go to Iberia, go here, go to France, go to Portugal, go here, go to Germany, Ireland, Scotland to get your slave labor. Biographical data can be used to illustrate the critical importance of indentured labor to agricultural development during this period. The careers of Henry Winthrop, the young son of famous John Winthrop of Gruton and Suffolk and Puritan governor of Massachusetts, and Thomas Burney illustrate the important forces operating within the early Barbados plantation economy. All right. Winthrop arrived in Barbados during the tobacco boom of 1628 and wrote to his uncle Thomas Phones in October, stating that he, though intent God willing to stay here on the island called Barbados in the West Indies, and here I my servants to join in planting of tobacco he soon realized that in order to continue in tobacco production his plantation needed every year some 23 servants he was satisfied that the importation of servants from england at a cost of five to six pounds for the passage of 10 pounds annually for food clothes and shelter was indeed money well spent after his first crop reached London, he wrote to his father, demanding more indentured servants in order to expand his plantation. All right. For what? For his plantations, plantations. And we grow ups, you know, they put this idea that anything related to a slave plantation or a labor plantation or these any plantation in the Caribbean, no matter what period of their colonized, you know, their, their colonization, whether it was early, middle or late, you know, because they're telling us only early here. But no matter what, they always told us that plantation meant African slaves, meant that they were putting the people of color there from Africa, bringing them across the Middle Passage. But the real Middle Passage was from Europe coming over here. And it was really Europeans, indentured servants, that they did this with in the beginning and continued. Then they continued and they did it with the local people too, the indigenous people. And continuing in this article, and I want to read this part to you and you know, pay attention to this part, it says... The spread of sugar production throughout the West Indies demanded not only large sums of capital and technology, but also a considerable flow of labor with varying degrees of skill. From common field laborers to highly specialized artisans, by 17th century standards, the plantation was so sophisticated production unit demanding a labor force more complex than, say, an English estate. The grinding, boiling, curing, refining, and the stealing process of sugar manufacture demanded industrial machinery, which had to be assembled, maintained, and at times modified. All right. So check this out. What they're trying to tell you here. Now, when we think of uh, plantation and sugar plantation, we just think of so-called black Africans, so-called black, right? Melanated Africans coming you know, and working in these plantations. But then we're not thinking about the whole production part of it, which also takes in grinding, the boiling, the curing, the refining, the distilling processes. All right. The assembly, the maintenance, the manufacturing, industrial machine to, to handle industrial machinery. Those are skills that some people may have more of based on their experience. Some people develop these skills from apprentices. Some people just develop the skills from working in the, on a place like that for a number of years. Either way, a lot of these indentured servants 
had that experience and skills. And that was one of their things that they sold their service for. Their service was that skill. So again, what they're trying to let you know here is what they're about to tell you is that imagine you couldn't just bring anybody to just come work. You know, you needed to bring somebody that actually knew this process can, can help and manage and grind and boil and cure and refine and distilling. All right. So not just anybody from some random place in Africa that does never done this before could just come and do that. So what this meant it says here that a labor force with basic literacy and familiarity with advanced industrial technology was necessary. A labor force, a labor force that knew this, that had experience, was necessary in advanced industrial technology. In the early phase of sugar production, planters claimed that these qualities were rare in most Africans. Africans couldn't do this. You hear this is a big one right here. Big one. Like this. Mm. You got to think about that. That's logical right there. Yep. They needed people who were skilled in this. And they had them in England and Ireland. So why would they go get somebody that never has done it before in a place they've never gone to before and risk getting people, risk drowning, risk getting their ships sank, risk not even getting anybody because they got to go kidnap them, right? But in England, they got the whole system set up for them. They got already the labor force separated and everything. They, the, the government is helping them bring these people over here. And they even say, these are skilled in this. These ones are skilled in that. So you got to choose from sometimes, maybe even pick specific venture service. Like, hey, can you send me some that have worked in these kind of uh, companies or in these kind of uh, fields so they can come here with that experience and help us in this plantation and that's what they did and that's what they're letting you know here and it was rare and these planters were telling you it was rare to find these qualities in most africans and when they were present though it politically necessary to suppress or eradicate them as a result they became heavily dependent on white indentured servants to make the critical transition to sugar production all right. Now we're going to dodge the hijack big time here because they're going to keep saying white only because these are Europeans they're bringing. It was only white people that was indentured servants. And that's not true. There's a lot of European melanated people coming over and working in these sugar plantations as well. We've already got that. We already know that. Right. We know we got to open our horizons here. We got to dodge the hijack big time. You know, even though we're getting dropped, we getting we just got some major drop. Then they bring us to the hijack a little bit, and maybe they do it unknowingly. And they're assuming only because they're Europeans that they're pale skin, and they're calling them white. But even though they were dependent on these indentured so-called white and servants, right? For what? For the sugar, the critical transition to sugar production. The majority of planters found indentured servants qualitatively adequate for sugar production. The result was a very large increase in the demand for servants during the sugar boom of the late 1640s and early 1650s. The Civil War in England was critical in releasing a large number of laborers. And between 1645 and 1650, at least 8,000 servants joined the labor force. Remember, political prisoners, all these people who were losing these wars were being sent over here. And who were these people? By 1652, some 12,000 servants were employed in Barbados sugar production, not Africans. Governor Atkins noted that during the period of early sugar production, indentured servants did most of the work on the plantation. Again, Governor Atkins, all right, listen to all the Pan-Africans out there. It says here that Governor Atkins noted that during the period of early sugar production, indentured servants did most of the work on the plantation. These poor tradesmen and artifiers from the British Isles, Atkins noted, were critical to the development of the sugar industry in the colony. Critical in the West Indies. They were critical in North America, all the colonies. So real history if you're starting to pay attention, this is how it really went down. It wasn't no African slaves. During the period of 1628 to 1655, indentured servants experienced a degrading form of servitude. They worked as field hands and gangs on the plantations. Again, 
gangs in the plantations who indentured servants, not Africans. Sugar production in both the old and new worlds had long been associated with slave labor and servants found their working relationships in the West Indies more oppressive than anything they had experienced in Britain. Both, again, pale-skinned people and colored people, melanated people. They worked in gangs with their African counterparts. That just means colored. They worked in what gangs? With their colored counterparts under severe overseers. The evidence of servants working with slaves in the sugar fields is interesting because it became common in the 18th century to designate field work as nigger work. You see? It's interesting that eventually they try to make that and relate that to people of color or that derogative word. All right, so it wasn't, it's clearly that it wasn't, there's clearly, in all those Europeans, thousands and thousands of pale-skinned people that were in the plantations working in gangs, field hangs, gangs on the plantation, property being treated like property, slavery. Ligon noted how servants worked as field hands on the sugar estates between 1647 and 1650. And concluded that they got a harder share of the work than the slaves who were worked lightly during the first two years of seasoning. The hours of field work were indeed long. West Indian planters operated on the sun up till sundown rule, using all daylight hours to advance the plantation. Generally, the work was hard, the diet poor, and the overseers brutal in their discipline. In 1648, Legon worked on Cole Marty Fort's plantation which employed 28 servants and was able, therefore, to provide a first-hand account of their working lives. He noted, all right, a primary source, he noted that when the servant ships arrived, the planters hurried abroad to inspect the white cargo. After the allotted time, remember, look at white, it's in parentheses. So remember what I talk about parentheses, the white cargo, because they're European. They just put them as white because they're European. But there's colored people included in that. People with, with you know, dark complexions. After the allotted time, which was given to rural planters to travel into town, the sale began. It was a time of great activity in Bridgetown, as the auctions temporarily dom dominated the town's business. After making his purchases, the planter would send his new servants to the plantation with an overseer. On their arrival at the plantation, the servants had to build their huts in which they were to live over the period of their indentures, which ranged from three to ten years. The next day, Work began with the ringing of a bell at 6 a.m., according to Ligon. So they had to uh, build their own huts, right, right away. If they resist, their times are doubled. And if they complain, they are beaten by the overseers. So you see how these people were being treated, right? So it's not just a Kunta Quinta story. In 1655, one observer noted that in spite of the large number of colored slaves on the island the custom of all merchants trading theater is to bring as many men and women as they can no sooner does ship come to anchor than the islanders go abroad inquiring what servants they can buy these servants planted weedeth and manureth the ground all by hand in which lies their estates during the 1630s and 1640s planters kept gangs of female servants that weed and do common work about the plantations, but after the 1670s, female servants were not allowed in the field. They were kept primarily for domestic and sexual functions. Again, for what? For domestic and what? Sexual functions. Field servants were divided into three basic groups. Firstly, there was a group of subordinate overseers who worked part of each gang and were responsible for making sure that each daily task was completed. Secondly, there were the gangs of common servants who did most of the field work with the slaves. Thirdly, there were the gangs of common women who performed work about the plantations. I want to read uh, from this article now. Uh, it's called A Righteous and Unruly Lot. Irish indentured servants and freemen in the English West Indies, 1644 to 1730 by Hilary uh, McDee Beckles. And this is from the William and Mary Quarterly, Volume 47, Number 4, October 1990. You can find this on pages 503 to 522, about 20 pages. It says here, 17th century English planters in the West Indies, 
like their mainland counterparts, just like the ones in North America, established plantations with white indentured servants. Like them, they had to control or suppress the unruly behavior of disgruntled servants and landless ex-servants or freemen. All right, so continue further down in the article, starts talking about, uh, you know, the convicts and the political prisoners. So it says Barbados was the favorite West Indian dumping ground for political prisoners during the Commonwealth. On September 15, 1649, after the Battle of Drogheda, Oliver Cromwell informed John Bradshaw, president of the council, that the enemy were about 3,000. They made a stout resistance, but those who escaped with their lives are in safe custody for the Barbados. They are ready to be sent to the Barbados. In October 1655, he ordered that all English, Scots, and Irish prisoners in Dorchester jail be forthwith sent to Barbados. All right, convicts. In addition to political prisoners, many hundred of Irish were legally defined by the state as social undesirables and transported to the West Indies. So if they said, oh, they don't like you or they see you look kind of funny, kind of poor, you're walking around like, oh, he's an undesirable. I don't desire him. I don't desire that guy. <laughs> so he got sent because I don't desire that guy. He got labeled an other sire. Well, he got transported to the West Indies to help meet the insatiable demand for sugar planters for labor. All right. We just got the other article about sugar plantations. Same thing. And again, not Africans. They're supplying these plantations with. Transporting such people had begun with the English poor under the Charles I. Cromwell's regime carried out the practice on a far larger scale with the Irish. In 1654, for example, governors of several Irish counties received orders to arrest all wanderers, men and women, and such orders other Irish within their precincts as should not prove they had such a settled course of industry as yielded them a means of their own to maintain them. All such children were in hospitals or workhouses, all prisoners, men and women to be transported to the West Indies. You hear this? And you think all these people were pale skinned? Why is the West Indies so dark complexion then wouldn't there be more descendants of these so-called white pale europeans even though there is today we do find you know like irish descendants and all that and we do know the story of indentured story and, and we think it was just part of it and just no they were also colored people that look just like people from africa coming in but they were irish they were scott they were german and these people eventually were classified as negro people mixed in with all the other people of color and just real quick i'm not going to read from it but just want to remind everybody about this book and you know that there is records of these uh you know indentured servants being brought over here this is a book called the original list of persons of quality emigrants religious exiles political rebels servant men sold for a term of years apprentices children stolen they even admit they stole children maidens pressed and others who went from great britain to the american plantations from 1600 to 1700 with their ages the localities where they formerly lived in the mother country mother country england not africa the names of the ships in which they embarked and other interesting particulars from miss preserved in the state papers department of her majesty's public record office in england edited by john camden Houghton. This is to the members of the Genealogical and Historical Societies of the United States of America. This collection of the names of the emigrant ancestors of many thousands of American families, many thousands of American families that came in here like indentured servants is respectfully dedicated by the editor John Camden Houghton. And this is just an example of the contents in this book. It basically is a lift or a muster or a census, as they call it, list of ships conveying immigrants to Virginia before 1625. To, uh, 26. Look at this. The Abigail, Ambrose, Anne, Blessing, Bonanova, Hercules, Hopewell, Jacob, James, Jonathan. These are ships. Swan, the Tiger, the Treasure, the Warwick. All right. The Flying Heart, the Falcon, the Elizabeth, the Mary, the Margaret. All right. That's one of the ships that Anthony's wife came on. And she was listed as a Negro. The Negro Mary and the Margaret. That was his wife. She was a Negro from England. This ship was coming from England, not Africa. All right. So we showed that and we read from this book. Uh, in the last context, I wanted to remind you, you know, that it's in here. You know, they even list all the rebels they have here and sent to Barbados, all that that we just read. Called Bound Over, Indentured Servitude and American Conscious by John Van Dersey. And you in the book, and this part of the book, uh, introduction, you know, just to finish it up. And it goes into uh, basically the point I was saying earlier about the American Revolution and 
who these people really were. And he's and they right before I read this, they explain how you know it really wasn't about really caring about people. It was more of a political thing. But what were they really fighting? If they all all they talk about is slavery and tyranny and all this stuff and, and being free and liberty, who who were they talking about? Were they talking about? They weren't talking about just the so-called Negro, because they had slaves. Remember, these people had indentured servants. They didn't care really about that. So it says here, why were the acts of the colonial authorities and of Parliament so often linked? By colonial speakers and pamphleteers, so people in 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 media, like the people in the media, right, or in, in publishing, making the the books, you know, commercial ads, advertisements. All right, so why would these and speakers, motivational speakers, public speakers, pamphleteers, Samuel Adams, John Adams, James Otis, Thomas Jefferson, John Dickinson, Stephen Hopkins, Joseph Galloway, with slavery and tyranny. There was only one British practice which could and did actually subject colonial men and women to tyranny and enshacklement. So they're saying there was only one real reason what they were really fighting. And it was basically in that time, the only thing that existed was indenture servitude that kind of affected colonial people. It didn't just affect so-called African slaves, right? Because we're learning, right, that it's all Europeans that were there was affecting. So these people are being affected by that. And this is the main thing they were uh, fighting for, uh, you know, their cause was the whole indentured servitude system. The experience of servitude was both widespread and intensely personal. The practice was present, at least at s settlement stages, in every colony. Again, in every colony, in the very, since the very beginning, they are saying at least, no, all, all the way up until the 1800s. We already know that. We read this before. All right, so... This was there since the early stages of the colonies, the most prosperous colonies, Virginia and Pennsylvania, were economically founded on it. They were founded. Virginia and Pennsylvania was because of indentured servitude, not because of African slavery. They didn't owe it to African slavery, their, their establishment. It was because of the indentured servitude system. Moreover, the uprooting and transplanting of people to the new world. When we mean people, they mean Europeans, usually occurring in youth, in some cases in childhood, involving the separation from parents, brothers, sisters, and a home, produced, as we shall see over and over again, the kind of emotional trauma that individuals never entirely escaped and whose effects resounded through the decades. No other colonial experience was so common and at the same time so profound. Basically, they didn't care about no African slaves or people of color or people coming from Africa. That was not the real reason of the whole American Revolution and freedom or even the Civil War, any of that. All right. These people were going through their own indentured servitude. A lot of these people were indentured servants slash slaves. That's the hijack. Thus, people with dissimilar and sometimes conflicting interests could be united into a common opposition that focused and directed their deepest energies and frustrations against a single target. The old world hierarchy extended to the new, the transporting authority under which they had been brought over, in which they were under, brought over, under. They were under this system of indentured servitude. This is how they got here as slaves. They were brought over here as slaves, as indentured servitudes from the old world. Yeah, so-called old world. This is the true old world. But they mean England, right? Their mother country, which continued to rule them with potentially arbitrary power of a servant's master. In which, in order to be truly autonomous individuals, they would have to discard. All right, so they would have to get rid of that system, is what he's saying. That indentured servitude, you know, that's what they were really fighting for the Revolutionary War. And you know what? They even use indentured servants to do that. It's so ironic, right? On both sides. Mm -hmm.